Okay, and then we can try this structure that uh, was proposed last meeting. Of, we'll try to keep it kind of brief, the general description, and then uh, we can go into the details as we when we discuss it later. Uh, but I guess also, I mean, people can just add comments or questions as we go along in the chat. So we kind of uh, have them all stored as they come, you know, as people think of issues or things they want to discuss, perhaps if we add them all in the chat. So we have for the discussion part already some stuff to debate, you know, uh, even if it's not really a good idea to interrupt, like to have the debate as we present because of this new format. Uh, and Chago, perhaps I can share the screen then. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I erased some of Rafael's comments on the side. There were some funny comments uh, that he had on the side, like, take that delusion people or something like that. That's funny. Uh, so I don't know, do you, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for indulging us in this uh, experiment. Uh, this is the final result of a year and a half of conversations, right? I think, I think so, right? A year and a half. And, um, yeah, I think so. We uh, began this project as um, as a parallel effort to uh, Dennis and Gabriel's reading of the Capitol, uh, trying to uh, broaden its uh, analytical uh, language through another conceptual space, uh, that being of the, the conceptual space of the phenomenological um, Phenomenology objective, right? Yeah, objective phenomenology. Objective phenomenology, yeah. And uh, we, we try to uh, apply this same frame of reference to uh, Levi Strauss and uh, the theory of the gift and uh, uh, modes of sociality in the, in South America uh, in the in the low uh, regions of the South America of South America, and um, yeah. Uh, the thing that really uh, caught our attention in the beginning of our discussions was that uh, most uh, of the, the cases, the ethnographic cases that, that were coming out of South America, they uh, tended to present themselves uh, through the contours of counter examples like uh, their class. So politics uh, throughout the world is where you can find uh, a separate organ of power in the social uh, body but in this in south america politics is exactly is exactly the opposite it's trying to not let the uh, separate organ of, of power uh, being detached from um, from the social body etc and uh, uh, our primary effort was try was to try to uh, resettle this counterexample as a way into the structure itself that uh, yes the in South America we tend to find many counterexamples to the theory of the gift to uh, kinship theory and whatnot but it uh, also allows a magnifying lens lens to the inner functioning of this extreme of these structures. And this is what we're trying to pull off here uh, throughout this text is how we can use the ethnographic cases found in South America in order to reshape and um, broaden the scope of the theory of the gift of kinship theory, uh, Levi Strauss, and, and the whole bunch. Yeah, I think that it's worth mentioning for people who are have never read this sort of case study is that, for example, a lot of anthropology studies gift giving in this sort of reciprocal acts that establish, you know, relations of alliance, of kinship, you know, constructs a sort of more and more stable sort of relations. And then many of the case studies in 
South American societies, you don't find that kind of exactly. accumulation exactly. of stability. So it looks like the opposite of it, right? It looks like the anomaly or exactly. what's the outside of it. Yeah, as the alliance theory is in a sense a theory to find algorithms of social morphology. So where you can find uh, an alliance taking place, you can find the general shape of a social organization. So, and this is what uh, Gabriel is uh, pointing out here in South America, a marital alliance, alliance in general is always in a sense toward it, uh, it presents itself through uh, an oblique angle. And I think that one of the, the things that kind of rhetorically was very nice is that there is this very famous Brazilian anthropologist, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, who has a very paradoxical position of clearly being continuing Levi Strauss's work and being very influenced by him, but being also the guy who is, let's say, the big representative or at least readings of his work usually are the ones that lead to this conclusion that, well, what happens in South American societies is outside of you know, the structures of kinship that Levi yeah. Strauss described. So, for example, philosophers interested in the outside or things beyond, before, outside of the state, outside of stability, outside of structure, tend to fetishize a lot of his writings and to prefer, you know, even either positively giving a positive spin to say, well, if the, the societies he's studying don't present those characteristics, they show that these things are not universal and there is some even more creative, more freeing way of organizing outside of these structures. Or you can give it a negative spin and say, therefore, societies, uh, South American societies are even more primitive. They have not even developed a sort of social logic. They're just, let's say, uh, uh, lagging behind, right? And uh, I think the rhetorical spin we found is that in the beginning of uh, uh, Viveiro's biggest book, or kind of systematization of his, uh, of his work, he, he has this, he qualifies what he's doing as studying societies that are uh, before elementary structures. Uh, and we try to reinterpret this before in the sense of, well, this doesn't mean that they are outside. It just means that from, by studying this, this supposedly counter examples or this anom anomaly cases, you're actually seeing a logic before the logic gets generalized or acquire certain property. So it kind of motivated our kind of the reason why using our work with objective phenomenology would be interesting. The idea was, well, we need a concept of logic and we need a, a grammar, a conceptual grammar that is able to accept that there is logic even before the logic gets generalized. So our basic task became to show that from the perspective of the stuff we've been developing in the STP, we can demonstrate a continuity between what happens before the elementary structures of kinship and what happens in those structures. We just need to add the extra steps between the two things to show that actually when you look at the, the societies in South America, you see the same logic as Levi Strauss was studying, but almost in its pure form. Exactly. So it's about, let's say, being able to stitch together two more or less conflicting uh, parts of ethnographical work. Yeah. Uh, I think that. Uh, we, we divided the text. Um, I think we can we use the text perhaps to, to guide the, the presentation. It, the text is divided into, there's this general introduction that sets up this, this particular point about how most uh, authors treat the societies in the lowlands of South America as uh, counter examples that are outside of the theory or outside of the logic of the gift. Uh, and then a first, uh, section that introduces objective phenomenology as our, our hypothesis as to what can solve that impasse. And we, we have a good uh, starting point because there is one philosopher who's very much connected to anthropology called Patrice Maniglier, 
who at some point in his trajectory read Logics of Worlds and concluded that there was only two, what he says, there's only two attempts to formalize what he calls the ontology of variation, which would be the ontology of anthropology. And he says, Levi-Strauss's theory of the myth and the definition of world proposed by Badiou. So he gave us this entry, even though he didn't explore this very much. So we could say, okay, let's run with Badiou and see if it does help us, right? So after this second section where we introduce why the objective phenomenology is a good perspective, and I think that we give a good description. I, I, it was at least the first time I described it in this way uh, as to why this is compatible with the distros. The distros, at some point, he, he describes his own endeavor as a Kantianism without the subject. And it's interesting because it's a good description of Badiou's project as a sort of transcendental theory that doesn't presuppose the transcendental subject, right? Uh, so we found a couple of connections there to continue exploring, which try to show that uh, Logics of Worlds is comparative in, this, in a sense that is very similar to anthropology, but anthropology perhaps because of the needs of ethnography, right? You need to compare particular societies and then you arrive at a logical structure through the comparison. Whereas Logics of Worlds is comparative all the way down. Right. Even the first movement of a transcendental logic is to compare two things. So it almost internalizes the anthropological drive to find out what's universal and what's particular by comparing differences. It turns that into the very building block of transcendental logic. Right. Uh, and then after this introduction to objective phenomenology, we divide the text. In, and I think that this is worth mentioning because uh, I think it, we ended up systematizing very nicely a structure that we can use both for dealing with the logic of capital, the logic of state, and the logic of reciprocity, uh, which is to divide, it, the, divide our analysis into four steps or four moments. There is the, what we call the transcendental logic. Then there is what we call the phenomenal logic or phenomenic logic. Then there is what we call atomic logic. Then there is what we call worldly logic. And one builds on top of the other. And it's not exactly the same way as Badiou does. In fact, Badiou almost coincides transcendental and phenomenic logic. They are both presented in the same chapter, but we separate them because we need to show that you can have a transcendental logic which is not yet stable. Uh, which is something Badiou doesn't explore, right? When he introduces the transcendental logic, it's already the logic of how appearances can become stable and, true in, and become phenomena and so on and so forth. So we, we separate that a bit because that's useful for us. But then after this, we divide the, the, the paper into present a presentation of, of the formal stuff. So let's say pure transcendental logic, then a discussion of transcendental logic in anthropology, and then ethnographical cases that support our reading of anthropology that is supported by our formal approach, right? So we do that kind of triad of formal stuff, conceptual anthropology, and then ethnographical study for each one of these four logics. That's why the paper currently has 60 pages, and we're pretty much halfway through uh, some of the stuff. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think that this is actually this first step that I mentioned that we separated transcendental logic from phenomenal logic from, from the phen logic of phenomena. Uh, in Badiou, if, if you read Logics of Worlds, you will see that he, he talks about this, what he calls the function of appearing, which is just a comparison of identities and differences. And he goes straight to the axioms that make these comparisons consistent amongst each other. Right, so, well, if you compare X and Y and they are very similar and you compare X and Y with Z and they're very similar, therefore X and Z must be similar in this and that way. So it guarantees the stability of your evaluation. But I think that it was actually true marks that we got and, and we did this in, in the primer as well. It was true marks that we realized that you no know, Marx formula of value 
Just one second, guys. My dog is eating everything. What, what are you eating? Sorry guys, my dog was eating some plastic stuff. I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, we realized through Marx that when Marx is describing the value form, he actually starts from a transcendental logic, which is not consistent, which is what he calls the accidental form of value, right? The accidental form of value, it's both uh, a an objective thing in the sense that the proportion of two things being exchanged, uh, if you start doing that very often, you will see that these proportions are not subjectively decided. But before you have some stability, like a small market or even a, of money, uh, if I exchange with you here, then I walk to the corner and I exchange with somebody, nothing guarantees that these things will exchange for the same value. So through Marx, we realize that objective phenomenology can accept a local transcendental logic, a, a sort of inconsistent application of a transcendental criteria, which is already giving, like anticipating where we're going because we were looking for a way of saying that even in the cases where you don't find elementary stable structures of kinship, that a certain logic is already at play. So finding in Marx this idea that, well, perhaps transcendental logics are the most accidental ones. That's why uh, uh, you can have objective evaluations of value that don't match up, right? People can still exchange objectively things, but they can still make money from simple circulation if things are not consistent, right? So our first thing was to introduce transcendental logic at, to show that it has structure, it is a logic, but it's not yet consistent. So what structure can transcendental logic have if it's not consistent yet, right? Well, the logic it can have is that there are many ways of evaluating things, right? So given two multiples, uh, there is a certain set of values that they can acquire. For example, they can be said to be totally distinct or they can be said to be totally the same or they can be kind of similar. So they have some intersection, but we don't know what it is. Well, the set of these values here, there are many sets of these values that can be, let's say, the space of possible results of evaluating things. For example, imagine a case where we don't have the middle ground. So either two things are separate or they are the same. There is no, they are more or less equal. That's different from this sort type of evaluation, right? So you can have, let's say, binary transcendentals. You can have transcendentals with gradual values. And we will see that we're going to introduce, you can have transcendentals with kind of uh, inconsistent values or with uh, a sort of uh, contradictory values or something like this, as we were going to see. So even if the logic, Let's say not every, not every application of the formula give us always the same value. So I, one evaluation gives X and Y as different things, but in another context, somebody evaluates and they are the same. Well, that's inconsistent. Yeah, but you still apply the same logic. So you can talk about this logic, even if their applica the applications of it doesn't really need to stability. And that's one of the characteristics that we're gonna explore. On the one hand, we're going to say that the logic of affinity uh, in certain societies doesn't really constitute a world where all the evaluations are stable. And this will ultimately lead us to a theory that's very important for these case, case studies in South America, which is the construction of worlds where perspectives are not transitive, and not stable. So I can have a perspective on the world and suddenly discover that the way that I'm seeing from a different perspective redescribes the world in an incompatible way 
with how I see it from my point of view. So on the one hand, we're going to use that in our favor. So again, it already shows that there is some continuity where supposedly there is not. And on the other hand, we propose that the logic of reciprocity, the logic of gift giving is not a logic like the one that Badu uses, which is intuitionistic, a logic that you can either have like total difference, total similarity, and a bunch of values in between that are, can might even be incommensurate and so on. We actually propose a different basic structure for this, right? So, but we present the theory of Badu's transcendental here. Uh, we use some examples of a table. Let's say it's a binary transcendental, or if it's it has some intermediate values, just give some more or less intuitive description of these things. Uh, and then once we settle this, that there is a, a theory that both claims transcendentals are objective, they're the logic of differences and identities that don't come from your head or from a subject, but from the real interrelations between things. Uh, and we show that this logic has structure, even if it's still local and unstable, we move towards anthropology and show that, uh, that we can recognize such a logic inside of a uh, classic Viveiros de Castro text called the problem of affinity in Amazon, uh, where he introduces this idea of, he says, to think, to think the problem of affinity, to think like this basic logic of affinity and alliances and, and gift giving in South America, you need to, to step back and think of something he calls potential affinity, which he himself associates with a a priori, synthetic a priori of Kant. Uh, so it is a transcendental kind of point of view. Uh, and, and the characteristic of this potential affinity is that it has this, it has this figure or it allows for this figure of what he calls the included third, uh, which has two properties, the, the, this, this sort of a uh, particular sort of relation that can appear. Uh, the first property is that, I think I, I have it here, yeah. The first pro property is that it allows for non-binary values, which is something he, he studies in terms of, for example, you see that it's not really kinship or blood relations that establish some forms of social connection, it's actually distance, for example, right? So you have gradations of kinship based on distance rather than hereditary traits, for example. Uh, so it, there is some level in which this is not a classical kind of structure, but the crucial one is the fact that there is something which he calls this perpetual disequilibrium, meaning when, when you evaluate something as being outside or different from you, or when we evaluate something as being similar to you, there's still the possible evaluation that something was left indeterminate by that evaluation. So for example, that's why you can establish some relation of trait and still be not sure if you made a friend or an enemy after it, right? I'm not sure if there's any particular case we could exemplify just to make this clear. Uh, yeah, this is the, the classical case and an affinity in the in the lowlands of South America is that um, the father-in-law is is usually linked with a cannibal figure because this trade, this exchange of women, is always uh, ridden with tension. Like uh, like Gabriel said, uh, you never know the what is seen from the perspective of the other. So the son-in-law and the father-in-law, they uh, have this uh, connection mediated through the exchange of women, but both of them don't know exactly the status of the relationship that is being built. So the, the father-in-law is perhaps a cannibal figure that will uh, exterminate the son-in-law or the son-in-law is a witch, uh, a witch man that will uh, poison the, the kinship group, the cognatic group and et cetera, the, the, 
the status of the relations of the relation is always in undefined. Uh... And and I think that uh, uh, if you look at this, this is a famous kind of diagram that Viveros constructed to talk about this potential affinity, and you get this kind of tree of you divide it from what is not affinity, but there's always a bit of a remainder. And you're obliged to redivide things again between affinity and not affinity, but there's always a remainder, a disequilibrium and asymmetry, and you need to redivide it again, as if there's always something left that doesn't allow you to make sure if you establish a stable alliance, right? So you can see that the idea of instability or a sort of indeterminate value, right, to something of the other or to something of yourself is kind of always left open and inviting a new differentiation, right? You can see also why uh, Deleuze was all kind of a, a, a kind of philosopher who offered himself to interpret these processes because there's a bit of, you know, disjunctive synthesis and also something like a continuous process of differentiation that never ends, right? Difference itself seems to appear, that sort of thing, right? Uh, and uh, there is a quote, a really good quote from, from Viveros, where he says that uh, it's, it's as if potential affinity doesn't simply divide things between the third, like the same or the other, but it also marks the value of not being determined, right? So as we were saying, you can exchange, and rather than this totally sta stabilized, we exchange women, there is a restricted exchange form, Therefore, we now recognize each other as two clans or something. Something is still left, kind of, it's not that it's invisible. It's actually that it's visible that it's still not determined, right? It appears in the guise of not being determined and still, therefore, a menace, a possible danger, something that you still need to account for, right? So this is where I think our first big wager, formal wager, which uh, I feel good for, from the, from the readings I've done, I feel very good using it. Uh, but we, not only do we not uh, master this formal structure, but even the literature is debating what the hell it is. Because there is uh, the intuitionistic structure for this evaluatory process. It's called the Heiting algebra, the way that the values of this gradual a uh, uh, tree of possible values of similarity or dissimilarity, the way that this tree is structured, but you even uses this a lot, it's called a heightening algebra. If you reduce this to a binary decision, it's either true or false, it's either included or excluded, it's either the same or the different, you get a Boolean algebra, which is also a very well-known structure. But there is a version of this structure, which is called the Breuer algebra, which is said to be, let's say, the topos theory uh, counterpart to paraconsistent logic, to a logic that accepts contradictory values. But it's not really, first of all, there is the problem that a lot of mathematicians consider it to be trivial, because most of the descriptions of Breuer's algebra are, I mean, there is the non-trivial version, which is to say, it is the, the ordering, it is basically the, the algebraic correlate to the topology of closed sets. So uh, intuitionistic logic is pretty much natural to a topology of open sets. Uh, Breuer, would, so the, let's say the non-trivial description is that, but there's a trivial description which says, well, a Breuer algebra is just, if you relabel uh, joints and meets, it's, it's meant to be the dual of the hiking algebra. So everything that goes up in the ordering tree of a hiking algebra goes down in the Breuer algebra. And people are still trying to understand if this is enough to account for certain properties or if you're almost inverting just the labels of some things. So it's not really established that it is the dual of the hiking algebra. But if you take from the people who study more from the algebraic topology side. The part that is interesting is that while the Heiting algebra, there is finite conjunctions, meaning there is a point that if you go down this structure, you reach disjunctions between, let's say, almost elementary values, 
below them, you have the minimal value. But going up, you can have infinite value. So given any two disjunctions, you might be able to find a union for both of them, like something that is bigger than both of them and includes both of them. The invert of that is, is a logic where once you find any two disjunct things, you can still find always one conjunction that is before the minimal value. So it's almost like saying, and, and this is pretty much uh, how it gets formalized, that you get the paradox of having two disjunct parts that nevertheless have something in common. So you can see the intuitive feel that you would have, for example, if you call this P and you say, therefore, that this is not P, even though P and not P have no intersection, they do have. So they are different, but they're not. So that looks like a kind of topological interpretation of para consistence, right? But we don't even go that much into it. The idea that even though you make a distinction, it's still possible to find a conjunction, something that is in, the, in common, but not really marked as such. It's not an interior and not an exterior, right? That's what we use as a basis. So this, this, this section here says, well, from the previous description of a transcendental, we saw that it is possible to think about an objective transcendental logic that is local and accidental, meaning it's not guaranteed that it's stable. And in this second section, we read Viveros to show that there is a mathematical structure for this transcendental that captures the properties that he calls the properties of this potential affinity that is at stake in the South American cases. Right, so that's pretty much where we get to the, in the end of this, to say, look, okay. sorry, yeah? Yeah, can I ask a question? Um, uh, so there are sort of like two concepts of, just to see if I understood right, like two concepts of uses of inconsistencies, right? Like the, on, the first, uh, on the first part, there is this, this inconsistency in terms of uh, of uh, the way that encounters can be local and, and contingent, right? So it's this inconsistency that's before the consistency given by the axioms of the, the triangle axiom and the symmetry axiom. So it's it's a more yeah. There's a it's not stabilizing to like. State, yeah, it's uh, unrecognizable forms that are like that, that circulate in a stable way. And then there is, which is a bit like an inconsistent logic, right? Yeah. And then on the second part, there is the logic of inconsistent proper, which is uh, the, the, the para consistent logic of, of tree value, the, uh, which we're trying to. So there are, so are, are these sort of like orthogonal properties that are needed uh for what you're doing or they're like solving do you think it's yeah i think solving? they're different things yeah yeah because you do say it's a move where you're trying to move from not do not talk about the an inconsistent logic but the logic of inconsistency right but these two parts seem to do these two things at the same time yeah i would say that perhaps we should use different words to talk i'm not sure chago what you think but perhaps we could call the the first case that's accidental to just say is a difference between unstable and stable form. So there is something as an unstable application of a logic, meaning it's very, very local. It's very, very contingent, right? But that doesn't mean it's not a consistent logic, right? Paraconsistent logic is a consistent thing. You can prove things. You can say something is wrong, right? It's still rigorous. It just includes a value that accounts for, right? It, it has a marked value for contradiction. It's not the same as saying that it's a contradictory formal apparatus, right? Exactly, it's, it's, a, it's to find a, a consistent way to describe this instability, this imbalance in the, in the relation. And I think that's also the reason why anthropology has such a big problem with Hegel because Hegel doesn't make that distinction, right? I mean, Deleuze seems better because he doesn't use the name contradiction. He uses like pure difference. Uh, so you're protected from the, this confusion between 
Well, isn't the fact that it is inconsistent the very proof that it is consistent? No, like you can have a consistent space within which you know unstable differences or unmarked values or things that are neither here nor there have a role to play. That's different from saying the logic doesn't make sense. It has a hole. It's not uh, kind of rational, right? Uh, and, and it's funny because when, when Viveros presents this potential affinity, one of the things that he does say is precisely that he's introducing this to make the dynamic, the dynamism of these systems properly rational. So it's all about, let's say, and I mean, and this is the, we will see that this is crucial throughout the whole thing. So even though the first aspect that the logic is unstable gets, let's say, overcome or solved in different ways, both in South American societies that we're going to show and in Australian societies and other systems where levi studied study this consistent kinship structure, even in the case where consistency or stability is, is established, that indeterminate value still plays a role throughout the whole thing. Right? I think that this is also a good segue to the first kind of description, like that the, the whole thing with Bourdieu that you added, Thiago. Perhaps we could talk about that, right? Because he seems very keen on that, right? Yeah. And this is the thing. Um, when you have the this very elementary form of uh, of, of gift giving. Uh, you also have this unstable, this in this instability, this imbalance uh, uh, playing a part. Um, because the whole thing about uh, uh, Bourdieu polemics with uh, with, with Levi Strauss is that he was very keen on uh, observing and pointing that uh, the gift giving process uh, could not be resolved in that triad of um, giving, receiving, and reciprocating, that there was uh, an, obs an obscure passage between these stages of gift giving that needed to be marked out due to the fact that the gift giving is unstable throughout uh, the whole process. Uh, that it's not evident uh, as the theory of gift uh, seems to portray it. Um, and. Um, one of the things that Bourdieu uh, points coming from the the Kabil example that he studies is that uh, you all, when you have this uh, basic form of gift and counter gift, um, you also need to have this um, hiatus, this uh, lagging uh, process that uh, the counter gift must um, be delayed. The, it must not be given uh, right, uh, right out, right at the start. So you you need to make the the passage from the first gift to the second gift obscure in a sense, because this instability, this imbalance where you don't know what will uh, be brought forth, that you don't know what will be uh, uh, what will come out of it, is part of the process itself. That. Uh, you need to delay the counter gift because this uh, this delay uh, in, in, inflicts uh, imbalance into the process, and uh, and this is what we try to uh, underline that um, the the imbalance, the the instability, right? That we're trying to describe it in uh, through Brouwer and uh, uh, and other uh, formalisms is that. This instability is part of the logic itself of the process, and uh, um, the both uh, both agents that are involved in, in, in the gift and the counter gift are in a sense is speculating about each other's intentions and motivations because this is not clear. Uh, the the imbalance is. Uh, um, part of the inner functioning of the gift. One, one way of thinking about this that I think it's really good is imagine in your birthday party, every time somebody gives you a present, you already have another gift to give them back right, right exactly. away. Exactly. Like it would make your intentions so obscure and dangerous. Like who is this person, right? So yes, the more you lag behind the, sorry, yeah? Yes, 
because you're trying to make very explicit that you you're a good intended person that you are oh yes i'm i'm, I'm, I'm reciprocating and you know, i'm a good person yeah when you try to make explicit your intentions this is the moment when the gift giving process ends because mm -hmm. the, the intention must be uh must stay obscure in a sense so uh i think that this is let's say a really good way to to answer renzo's question which is to say well the stability problem of the logic we want to solve we want to show that every society needs to solve it uh and that because the logic is this weird inconsistent imbalanced logic it can actually be solved in many ways but on the other hand that to understand the consistent stable forms you need to first accept that they are all dealing with that instability so the case where the instability is actually the most clear for example in south american society is that some things never really stabilize like perspectives or certain alliances and so on that actually gives you the key to understand something that is hidden in the stable formations. Just as Marx oh, yeah. said that the accidental form of value has the secret of the value form, right? Exactly. So in a sense, the, the second, like the, the logic of inconsistency, meaning per, per consistency, is a form of inter, internalizing the sort of real inconsistency of sort of like interactions in general, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's very nice to think about it as the most natural uh, logic possible in the sense that you don't know if you share a common ground with something other. Uh, the moment, so the most obvious value is indetermination or not being sure, right? And once you establish some level of connection, what Bourdieu says is, yeah, but this doesn't erase the problem of this lack of trust or this indetermination. It's just shifting it around, right? Exactly. And, and there, I'm just trying to find here the quote where, where uh, Vivero says something very good about this. He says uh, that uh, in this type of configuration, there is something what he calls an anti-extension. The, the marked anti-extension, the non-affinity of the dominant principle, which is, which is affinity, includes in an inferior level the dominant principle itself, but as a marked value. So before you apply the logic, you don't know the value of things. But one of the possible values of applying the logic is, I don't know the value of this. Right, so it's a logic that has true values, like inside, outside, and still to be determined, right? Or uh, you should pay closer attention to this. I'm not really sure where it fits, right? It's like the, the very basis of Borges' categorization, right? Where you have animals, you have this, and then you have the every other thing category, which you're really not sure where, what, what it is, right? So I think that it's very clear in this sense that Indetermination as what happens when you don't know the, the, the evaluations is let's say the non-marked dimension of affinity, right? It's the very reason why you need to evaluate things. But inside the logic of affinity, you have one value which marks, right? It makes appear that something is indeterminate, right? And just, sorry, just a last remark because I, I thought it's also very interesting because now it makes I understand a bit better that you 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 underscore like the this this unstable logic as as being local and accidental, right? And it seems that this captures like two a spatial and a temporal aspect. One regarding locality, which means like if if a certain evaluation propagates uh, non locally, so like it's consistent across like uh, paths like spatial across like different exchanges across the uh, space and there's this other dimension of that's what Tiago was talking about of the gift this temporal delay like if you encounter you have an encounter now uh, the indetermination of the, the next encounter is being uh, this way or that way so there's also this temporal 
in determination. Yeah, but that's... you see, the, the, the great thing about Thiago's example is that it shows that when you lag, you drag the values with you. So if I give you, if you give me a gift and I give it right back to you, you have no idea what will happen next time. But if you give me a, a gift now and I wait to the next time we meet and I give it back to you, it's actually more stable, right? Yeah. It's the minimal way of, let's say, winning community versus time, right? The minimal ver uh, 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 victory of, of alliances against time is that I can lag behind and give you a gift later rather than at the time, right? Yeah. And I mean, also, in, doesn't it like in cir circulation time is also something that like capital tries to sort of like shorten it to the minimum, but if you extinguish it, it also makes things collapse. Yeah. 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 I think that there is interesting comparisons there. I mean, I, I, I think that we, we make more comparisons with capital than we accept, like we, we, we admit in the paper. Because, for example, there is, when we get to the logic of phenomena, it's like we're moving to uh, what Marx calls expanded value form, right? Because now you have two paths in the phenomenological. So this is a kind of our own separation. We would say, well, transcendental logic has a structure, even if it's local and accidental. Now we want to ask, under which conditions do these local and accidental evaluations start to gain some consistency, right? And this is what Badiou tries to do with this phenomenal logic saying, well, now imagine I try to, I make many comparisons and I wanna make sure all these comparisons are consistent with each other. Well, he gives us two basic axioms that you need to respect in order to, for this to be the case that when you evaluate X and Y is the same as evaluating Y and X and that there is some triangulation of values that is respected, right? Uh, and with this, he defines the sort of lists of evaluations fixated on one object. And he says, well, the whole point is that all these evaluations suddenly become consistent with each other. And uh, there is definitely an analogy with the expanded form where suddenly, you know, a bag of rice is equivalent to an infinite, infinite series of other things. So suddenly you have a path from a fixed commodity to every other, to a certain proportion of every other commodity. So you already get some stability, right? And the, the problem of total coherence is left for the problem of money. But the, the idea that it takes a separate step, right? To make things uh, consistent with each other. It's pretty much what we described here in the phenomenal logic. And then we try to introduce a bit of, you know, a slightly more classic way of descri describing uh, categorically these things. Uh, and then we come to, let's say, the interpretation of phenomenological logic in anthropology. Because now what we, we need to do is we showed what this potential affinity that Viveros talks about is formally, which is this weird paraconsistent way of evaluating things as being either the same, different, or neither the same nor different, right? Uh, now we need to show that these three values of this logic are at stake in the smaller consistent structures that Levi-Strauss describes, and that they are actually at play in the logic of the gift, right? Uh, so they are not antithetical or outside or behind or before that logic. They are the very basis of that logic. So what, what Levi-Strauss calls the restricted form of exchange, which is the minimal way the two groups exchange and make alliance through that exchange, it needs to be des describable as an application of our transcendental structure and not as a correction or a different thing that you know, comes from elsewhere. So that's what we try to do here. Uh, and the first idea that we bring to the table, which I think is really cool, which is, in my opinion, I mean, we don't even develop it that far here. Uh, perhaps when we get to the ethnographical cases here, we might, but uh, which is the idea that, you know, Marcel Mauss, Levi Strauss, everyone who, who talks about 
gift exchange talks about the fact that people don't exchange. There's not only objects being exchanged, but there is some third thing that is at stake in that exchange, right? So the idea of the mana, and, and then Levi Strauss talks about this idea of the exchanged objects are like an empty signifier. So they kind of stand for any for a delayed signification that hasn't happened yet, and so on. And uh, we try to interpret this uh, in this little way here. Let me just show you. Let me see if I have the yeah. So th when this is Levi Strauss describing what he calls restricted exchange, which is the minimal form of stable exchange, right? He says. We understand that under the name of restricted exchange, every system that divides the group effectively or functionally into a certain number of pairs of exchange units, such that for every pair X and Y, the relation of exchange is reciprocal, meaning an, a man X marries a woman Y, and a man Y must always be able to marry a woman X. The simplest form of uh, restricted exchange is given by the division of the group in halves that are exogenic, right? That marry outside of their own group. So this is the little kind of drawing we made on top of this that uses the three values of our logic to account for that. So you have uh, in Portuguese, a uh, man with, is with a, a H, right? And woman is mulher, so with M. So a man in X and a woman in X and a man in the group Y and a woman in group Y, right? And the, the kind of simple idea is, well, if I have this group, but there is something in this group that can be given, it's neither inside the group nor, nor outside the group, right? Because it, it can move outside and carry something of the group with it. So the relation between the men and women in the same group is indeterminate. Uh, when a man from the other group marries this woman, they form an interior, right? A couple. And the moment that these two form a couple, these two recognize each other as two distinct things, right? So these two groups, they understand that they are separate to each other because there was something here whose value was indetermined inside and that now belongs to this group here, M. And inverse at the same time. Yeah, it, it and helps us to also describe that thing that you that you mentioned before that the points of view are not transitive to each other. So, the one that is my sister is your wife, and the one that is your sister is my wife, and both of these points of view cannot um, translate it to each other. It means that uh, I cannot see my sister as my wife, or there there is a a clear uh, imbalance, a clear division that. Uh, uh, establishes um, uh, an obscure passage between the points of view. So it, and it's also cool to see that you get this sort of uh, redescription of how once you exchange, then everyone can agree on the values, right? Uh, whereas prior to exchange, these values are indeterminate, right? After exchange, you now have a group here and a group here. And they both can say that they are stably exterior to each other, right? Prior to exchange, you have a group that includes something that I don't really know the value of. So you get that feeling of through the exchange, something which is indeterminate is moved in such a way that after the, the exchange, you now have a stable way of mapping from both sides what are the relations, right? So I, th I think it's a, it's a really cool way to say that when you exchange gifts, you're also constructing a common map of relations of affinity, right? You're stabilizing that menace we were talking about. What's the relation between, why, why be between them, the two women? Is it still inconsistent? Yeah, I, we have this discussion happening here on the side. Oh, okay. I think it's a big issue. For example, it's a good question. Let's say if these values here were maximal, meaning they belong to the same group, right? There is a unity between the women. 
I'm not sure what this would mean, you know. Uh, but then I felt like because these arrows are all I, perhaps that this is just needs to be consistent with them as well. But there is a whole discussion here on the side we need help with, I think, both ethnographically and uh, and logically to make sure what if if there are other values that could go here and this would make sense, you know. I think that there is one thing we know that cannot happen, which is there be an identity between the two things exchanged, right? Because if there is an identity between the two things exchanged, then I received back what I gave you. And the problem that Bourdieu was talking about comes back all over again. Rather than you getting caught up in the problem of gift giving and being in the same, let's say, now we're both caught up in the same problem. You just give it back to me. And then I no longer know how you stand. Right. Uh, so I think that there is this this uh, this way of explaining things. First of all, it accounts. For, it has this principle, this idea that when you exchange gifts more than exchanging objects, you are making distribution of these existential values compatible amongst the groups that are exchanging. Right, so you're expanding the size of the common world, which is pretty much what gift, gift giving does in many societies, right? Uh, you kind of domesticate this imbalance inside your own group and substitute it for two relations. Again, something indeterminate is substituted by something other and something same, right? Something other, two groups, one is other to one another, right? The same, there was a marriage, Two different people and now form one couple. So again, that that further determination of something indeterminate into the same in the other happens, right? So the first property of the gift in the way we understand it is to say that it expands the world of affinity, right? Uh, which explains, let's say, this additional transcendental quality that you know Moss is trying to Moss is trying to describe when he talks about the power of the gift. And that makes levi search in linguistics this signifier they have a second order value like the empty signifier the floating signifier right but this also explains the obligation of reciprocity right because uh the structure of affinity it poses this problem of imbalance all the time so when i give something to you which is indeterminate in my group you need to do something to let's say uh, domesticate that imbalance. So giving back by kind of co making cohere this different uh, points of view is it's not an obligation in the sense of a moral obligation. It's almost a cognitive obligation, right? It has an epistemological value, right? Uh, and I think that there is another Characteristics, which is again, we can also explain why the value cannot be identical to the first. Because if I gave you something which had an indeterminate value, and you identify the value of it as being the same as something else, you are dismissing the indetermination that I assigned to it. Right? The only way for you to give me the same is for you to give me something which is also indeterminate. So we can almost make, let's say, two types of equality between two things, right? Two things can be the same because they have the positive trait. They belong to the same set with the same property. Or two things can be the same because I cannot distinguish them because I cannot tell them, I cannot tell which property they have, right? One is, let's say, identity by discernibility. Two blue things are blue. The other is identity by indiscernibility, right? I cannot tell this thing apart. I cannot tell that thing apart. Therefore, I cannot tell these two things apart from each other. Right? I think that's also the reason why we put it the, the I here, in the sense it's a community by indetermination, by discernibility, not by discernibility. Right? Uh, and, and a cool thing about this is that if you change the value of these things here a bit, you get the structure of the inconsistent, or we call it inconstant exchange that happens in South American society. So let's say I cannot make sure that 
the relation between what was given back to me and the other group is a relation of indetermination. But for example, it's something external to that group or it's something that it's part of that group in a positive sense. If that's the case, then the, the mapping from this point of view and the mapping from the inverse point of view will not match. So this point of view and this point of view will not match. And I will be left wondering if the other is not dangerous. So the other might still have bad intentions, depending on, you know, if the, the exchange we had was not totally consistent in this coherent sense. So again, with the same logic, just a slightly different diagram where some values don't match up, you now get, let's say, the expression of a certain type of encounter where I, even though some exchange might happen with the other, it doesn't settle that perspectives are commensurate, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the problem with this restricted uh, diagram, as you can see, is that the very, the very thing that makes it consistent also makes it limited. Because if you now imagine a third group here, uh, whatever, I was going to put X, but just a third group here, how do we enter into relations with it, right? How do we know where it stands? So everything outside of this gets this kind of dangerous feel still. So there is something which Levi-Strauss called a generalized exchange, which is a kind of basic formula for expanding the form of gift exchange into a potentially infinite number of other groups, right? And it, is, it exchanges this crossed exchange for a structure that has this sort of form where a man from group A marries a woman from group B, but then the man from group B doesn't marry in the group A. He actually marries in group C. And, you, and this is open to the point that at some point, some N group marries a woman in group A and the cycle concludes, right? But locally, if you look at this structure, there is, let's say, an arrow open here, right? Like, like this, for example, right? So this guy marries this woman and this creates, let's say, a quasi-stable relation here because the, the, the reverse was not given. But I trust that this guy is going to marry from that other clan. But this also doesn't give you the cross. Uh, but then this guy is open to marry somebody who might appear in such a way that there might be appear somebody who then marries the woman in this first group, closing the circle. So it's both open in the sense that it has a space to include new encounters into its already consistent logic, right? And also more open in the sense that uh, if you just take a snapshot of it, of a local part of it, you don't see the global consistency. Right. So let's say it's, a, it's the moment where the global structure of gift exchange separates from the local structure of gift exchange. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we try to do something which I'm still unclear if it holds. But if you stitch all these values together, the indeterminate values are always inside, right? The little groups. And then you have this external and, in, and kind of interior values between the groups. If you stitch them together, Levi-Strauss says that the structure of this, this oriented gift giving that it goes on in a cycle should be a spherical structure. So we try to show that it's kind of like stitching together the edges of a po polygon, just like you would stitch together in the fundamental polygon of a sphere. But I, as I say here in the group, in the side, uh, I'm a bit, I mean, I'm insecure over everything, but this particular thing, I'm slightly more insecure than the rest. I mean, it might just be a, the sort of thing you can remove from the text and just, you know, spare yourself from some embarrassment. I'm not sure yet. 
I love it. Yeah, hopefully, I mean, it would even match the fact that if you do this with, I, I tried it on the blackboard here. If you do the same thing with the unstable exchange and you stitch together the po po polygon uh, that it would create, it gives you the Klein bottle, which is something that this Brazilian philosopher very uh, arbitrarily used in a text. Uh, and we could actually give it a bit more of a formal basis, but again, cra crazy additional speculation we don't necessarily need, right? Uh, and and we, we end this section by saying, well, you can see the problem both for the restricted and the general uh, form of exchange. It, it is consistent uh, uh, with using our tree valued logic. So it, we, we get to formalize it even slightly better than Levi Strauss by using this tree valued thing. It acquires a lot of properties that we are able to derive a lot of properties that Levi Strauss is describing. Uh, but it's also clear that even in this case, uh, two, two issues appear. The first question we, we need to answer is what is, what are these structures for the cases where that accidental value, the accidental uh, logic doesn't really cohere like so stably. So what we call inconstant exchange, which would be the case of how these structures get kind of matched up in the South American societies. And the second problem is uh, that when you separate local and global properties, so the cyclical property here, it's a global property, right? When you take a snapshot of this interaction, you don't know that it's gonna work. So once you separate the global from the local, the problem of the analogous problem of money appears, which is what are the, the preferred objects to be exchanged that have the most likelihood of guaranteeing that the values will be preserved as this is reproduced from then on. And this is why, this is, let's say, a proto-explanation where I, I, we still need to discuss this in more detail, but this is the proto-explanation of what Strathern calls the gender of the gift, right? And Levi-Strauss describes at the same time the development of generalized exchange and the selection and, and the problem of the givers of women, why women become the privileged object to be exchanged. And you see that this issue is very much at the edge of what Badiou calls atomic logic, which is no longer a logic that is simply, let's say, what, what uh, Marx would call the formal subsumption, right? A way of organizing things that are already out there, but more like a real subsumption of a logic, meaning the logic is embedded in the material formation itself. So when you select a certain object to be a privileged object of exchange, you suddenly need to ask yourself if there is something in the very composition, almost in the very nature, if you will, of that object that makes it more conductive to that logic than another object, right? We saw when we discussed money that there is something Marx calls the formal use value, which is precisely the material dimension, for example, of gold that makes it more conductive to value logic than, let's say, a cow. Why? Because if I divide a cow in half, it doesn't have the same uses as a living cow, right? It doesn't, you don't have this continuity where a half of the animal is just a half of the value. It just becomes something totally different. Whereas the half of a pile of salt or a half of a bar of gold, it's still gold. So it preserves in its very material composition a property that is that makes a difference in the world of value. So at this point, we're very much at the cross the frontier of the same problem to the logic of affinity. What objects or what particular dimensions of nature or of you know, life in general or objects out there are conductive to the logic of affinity, right? Uh, but before that, we, we, try, we actually have a bit of an ethnographical, uh, a new ethnographical moment where we try to compare like this kind of well-stable levi in cases with a case from where you don't get this exogamic uh, uh, coherence being established, right?
not sure if you think it's worth going into it now, Chad. Yeah, the, because this is the thing in, in, in the Levi-Straussian theory of exchange, gender doesn't play a role. It means that um, the general structure of exchange would function just the same if the objects being exchanged were men. The, this algorithm of uh, social morphology preserves itself uh, through either gender, right? If you're exchanging men or if you're exchanging women, the general pattern uh, is the same. But the thing that is fratern or sex in the gender of the gift is that it's not that uh, the gender is not important, it's that if you don't have a certain statics of gender, the gift giving cannot exist because uh, she, 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 in a sense, uh, in Melanesia, is in here, perhaps we can uh, discuss it later, that uh, in Melanesia, each, each gender is an, an analogic transformation of each other, right? And, um, uh, and this is essential to, um, to the gift giving process because, uh, um, well, let me let me try to uh, paint it uh, with broad brush strokes. Uh, in Levistros, what you have is the one that is a sister for me is a wife for you, right? But what you have in uh, in, in, in the Strathernian theory is that uh, is the one that is a sister for me is a wife for you and no one else because it is this, this, the sudden appearance of a wife is embedded in a theory of action in, in, in through which each gender presents itself as an analogic transformation of the other. So I know it sounds a little bit uh, um, unclear, but uh, this is the way uh, that Strathern uh, makes gender matter in the theory of gift exchange. That uh, so not just, that, it's not that gift, it's not Sorry, that gender yeah. is not important. Is that gender is the the condition? It's it's the very condition for exchange to happen. So, but in the sense that what guarantees that the relation of matrimony will stabilize. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like, why are why would marriages be counted as an interior? And the answer is, yeah. well, you need to have a gender roles previously established. Otherwise, being the wife doesn't mean forming an interior. It means something else. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, I think it's slightly different than this kind of atomic frontier we wanted to talk about, right? This formal gift value, so to speak, right? Because let me uh, let me try to let me try to explain it uh, with further detail of what happens in Melanesia. Uh, in Melanesia, uh, the domestic relationship is characterized by the exchange of hogs of pigs. Right, the wife she nurtures the the pig, and then gives it to the husband. Yeah. And uh, the whole gift exchange in Melanesia, it has this formal presentation that the clan that wants um, a wife from the other clan gives pigs to the other clan. So the clan presents itself as being the wife, you see, of the other clan. So it uh, it's there is already an and aesthetics of gender taking place for gift exchange. So the other clan, when he receives the hogs, the pigs, um, it, he, it sees itself as uh, the husband, uh, metaphorically, of the other clan. So the um, husband of the pig. Exactly. So it's a, so it, they, they are exchanging gifts, but at the same time, 
there is a gender role playing taking place. So they are already. You mean, be, you mean because the women will take care of the pigs? Exactly, because since I received from you the pig, it means that I'm not entirely male. I have a female part that belongs to the other clan. I'm recognizing that you see what there is a magic trick that happens when I receive the hog from you. Um, I'm tell, I'm saying that there is a feminine, a female part of me that belongs to you. So I must give you something of the same nature. I must give you a female in order to reestablish some balance in our exchange. So this is why there is this first moment of gift of of hogging of hogs and pigs being exchanged because there is a, an exchange of points of view. Each clan is now seeing each other as being either a female part of the other or a male part of the other. So this gender statics is being is crucial to the gift exchange itself. Um, I don't know if I'm um, because here is the. Uh, it's very. It's, this is a very uh, particular trait. It's a very particular trait to Melanesia and to the Melanesian cases. So, I, I, and Levi Strauss, he goes. Uh, he, he doesn't care about gender, and this is the thing. The, 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 the if you if you swap genders, the gender the, the algorithm of social morphology would preserve itself. If you're exchanging men or if you're exchanging women, it doesn't. Uh, it's not important. At it's all. purely functional. We, exactly. But we can see here in Melanesia and in the Melanesian cases of, of, uh, of the highlands that uh, Mr. Pern is uh, very keen on, 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 on Hagen and Mountain Oak, okay, is that if you take gender out of the equation, you cannot, you cannot understand what is happening. You cannot. But uh, Chavo, just to I mean, I'll, just to make two suggestions. One is that I think this is very interesting. We should talk about this. But then, secondly, perhaps we could also interrupt after this discussion, leave the the rest of the paper undiscussed for now. I mean, you yeah. can appear after the interval in the debate, uh, yeah. just so we don't take like because since we're halfway through, probably going to take the whole present whole meeting to do it. Yeah. So. Uh, but I was just going to say, in terms of what you just said, couldn't we say something like this? Like you have clan one and clan two. Yeah. And let's say first that the division between, let's say, what counts as a man and what counts as a woman is not marked. Okay. Yeah. So first I need to, this clan here needs to give something here to introduce the indetermination. Because yeah. then it has a problem. I don't know what, once you give me the hog, then there's something in me that is female, something which is not. So again, something is yeah, less. Yeah. And then I can give you the, we know that this has a value of I, after you gave me the hug. Exactly, exactly. Right? Because so, this is the thing, the, the gender in Melanesia is what is the statics of the indeterminate part, like you said. Mm -hmm. it, the gender is what is being established in every single step of the gift exchange. Okay, so, so, so each okay, so this fits as a transformation of the other. <laughs> okay, I'm happy that we can actually account for this. Like it doesn't. Yes, we can. That was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, perhaps we can take then the interval here with like a high note that okay, this we can account for it, and <laughs> yeah, you know, and then we can talk about I mean whatever you guys want to talk about or go over the rest of it after an interval. Yeah. Should we take like. Renzo, you're you're the representative here of the idea of taking an interval. How long should we? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, like five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Okay, it's a good. Uh, I'll feed the dog. I'll feed my hog. Coming back in five. Okay.
Okay, happy. Eu tô lendo aqui o texto. Muito coisa bom. curta, Miriam. Coisa curtinha. Não, eu, tô, eu ainda tô na página 4. <risos> <risos> Pô, cinco minutos. Cara, sei muito bom, mas depois eu quero ler direito a, a, a passagem da lógica transcendente. The Transcendental Logic to Phenomenological Logic. É fenomenológica ou fenomênica? É fenomênica. É da construção. É fenomênica. É da construção dos fenômenos, eu acho. Uma boa pergunta, eu não sei como é que a gente. É. Tô querendo Traduzir. saber como é que você tira o sujeito da equação. É. Lê aí depois. Eu preciso, preciso muito das suas críticas, Miriam. Porque se tem alguém que vai dizer que o sujeito não foi tirado da equação, eu sei que é você. Não, mas eu acho que é muito legal essa ideia de... de como, mas como objetos aparecem? Eles vão aparecer um para o outro. Né? É. Em, em disposições e campos específicos. E aí o ponto então, é que, é, digamos assim, é mais fácil reintroduzir o sujeito transcendental como um objeto com uma composição particular dentro do mundo, hum. para o qual os objetos vão aparecer por de um certo jeito, do que como hum. ponto de vista geral de todos os objetos que aparecem sempre para ele, entendeu? Uhum. Então, assim, não é contrário ao sujeito do Kant, ele só situa o sujeito do Kant como um objeto, Entre uma certa estrutura, objetos. e, portanto, os outros objetos aparecem para esse objeto de um certo jeito. Tá. É, não, isso ficou me lembrando aquelas aulas que você estava dando sobre capital, a coisa do, da mercadoria que aparece num determinado. Exato. A set, ideia... Um set de condições de possibilidade. Sim. Não, é a, me, é a me, o mesmo... Não, eu finalmente estou entendendo a, 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 a linha do Gabriel, assim, o percurso intelectual do Gabriel nos últimos três anos. Agora as coisas estão fechando na minha cabeça. Não, é sério, aí. Mas, Mira, eu, só, coisas... ah. eu queria muito te pedir o um favor de você... Pois assim, porque o texto ele tem essas sessões longas que são uma explicação dessa fenomenologia objetiva, meio de forma pura. Então, assim, ah. vê se isso faz algum sentido, porque isso é a base da abordagem que a gente está usando tanto para antropologia quanto para economia, como para, daqui a pouco, teoria do Estado. Então, tipo, se isso não Ô, fizer Gabriel, sentido... Não, mas me manda o um link pelo meu WhatsApp, porque você mandou só aqui no chat. Aí, na hora que fechar essa, essa reunião aqui, eu, eu perdi o texto. Ah, estou mandando agora. <risos> texto não, beleza. Mandado. Tá, vou ler. Tá bom. Vou esperar todo mundo chegar aí. Quem, quem for chegando, vai mandando um joinha. Whoever comes back just sends us a, a hi so we know who's back and if we can continue. Join you. Present. Okay, so, so just Vinicius, I think, is still coming back. And Thiago, I think Thiago is not here. I'm back. Okay. Yeah, so just, I'm not sure what you guys prefer. Uh, if we should, I mean, we can also go over more informally what we have after that. I mean, we can go over what we have informally. We can actually continue doing what we were doing, or we can just debate questions concerning what we already just presented, you know? I'd like to, to hear more where it's it's going, but it's me. Yeah, I don't really have <clears throat> much to debate. I do have a question, but overall, like I'd be down to continue for but, but what's the issue? What's the question? Oh, the question is just um going back to Caritani's characterization of Mode, and, and I'm not going to pretend to have read this guy, I've just read about him. I appeared to Clusters, I think. Um, both uh, talk a lot about the role of conflict and different kinds of conflict from like kind of symbolic, uh, uh, symbolic stands to outright genocidal <laughs> violence, like as ways that Mode A are characterized and I'm just wondering if that's played any role in your research or if this like how, how that kind of fits in 
uh, to all that and what that might in turn kind of link to some of the quest active contemporary questions about mode, like things like nationalism, stuff like that. Man, I think that there is part of the question, I think it's more complicated, which we didn't deal with yet. Right, Chuck, we didn't really talk about uh, negative reciprocity or war, which is just a parenthesis. It generally something I think we're still thinking through for all the modes, which is even in, even in the primer on the logic of value, we still haven't really discussed very much this sort of disequilibrium version of a logic, you know, the crisis version. I think that the most developed version we have this thus far is what we're doing now with affinity because actually we're inverting the logic and war appears in the unstable form of reciprocity already, right? When you exchange, but the, you exchange with your enemy. That's the, you can arrive at a form of war just by going through there, right? So we didn't really talk about uh, let's say, which are not negations of logics, but just the unstable form of them, right? So revolution is not a negation of the form of the state. It's just, let's say, an inconsistent state. Crisis is not a negation of capital. It's just, the, let's say, the inconsistent presentation of capital, something like this, right? Where you can exploit some... And it seems like war is not the negation of reciprocity. It's just a sort of unstable or inverted pre presence of it, right? Uh, but I think that generally that's something we're still... This, uh, we haven't really done enough on it. Uh, now, there's another issue you, you raised, which I think we did do something really cool with, because, uh, you know, like our theory of how to formalize the state logic is as a classical logic. If you look, like one way of thinking about the state is to think that it comes from the outside, uh, not in Karatani sense that another community needs to dominate a given community, and this is the basis of the state, the, the logic of one community dominating the other, but in the sense that it's a different logic than the one of reciprocity. But from our perspective, classical logic is included in paraconsistent logic. You need to restrict reciprocity, remove the indeterminate value, and just stay with the other two values, and you get the state logic. So that's why the state is always inherently at stake in the logic of affinity, which is clusterous kind of thesis that you need to keep the indetermination going to prevent the apparition of the state. We actually have a really cool formal interpretation of that. Exactly. That's really powerful because I think that goes a long way to accounting for the, the way in which Genghis Khan was capable of adapting a kind of nomadic mode societies like within a generation into a world state because he was actually, he didn't run away from Mode, he leaned into Mode in building exactly. this thing. Like he embraced its kind of logical, like exactly what we're talking about, that this is the best way to embrace differences. He embraced that and just kind of transformed the way in which decisions were decided, like made in the process. That's, that's really cool. That's really yeah, cool. so I, I find that like such a profound idea that you have this imbalanced logic and you're always trying to get rid of that imbalance. And actually, the tragic thing, let's say, is that the way to get rid of it once and for all is true total domination of one group through the other. Once you do that and you totally remove the determination from the equation, you get the state logic of domination, right? I mean, the classic idea that uh, the law stops the circuit of vengeance, right? So. I kill somebody in your family. Look, for example, you, you take out the eyes of somebody in my family, then I reciprocate with killing somebody in your family. And the famous Italian logic is to say, an eye for an eye, no imbalance. The moment that you do that, you turn the logic of the gift from the imbalanced logic with the three values into a classic logic with two values. Either you give the right sentence, right? So the two things are equal or it's not done, but there's only those two options, right? So you can actually derive one thing from the other, from the internal weakness of the other, rather than from the external something separate, right? And it's really cool that it also ties with how, like, uh, theories like Hansier and Badiou and Agamben, like, they locate this, this moment of where the state is 
or either destabilized or like its paradox or of, of its emergence arises as, as this moment of that which is not counted as a part of it is still inside it like this paradox of of something that doesn't respect this sort of interior this binary interior exterior or or, or what falls under the law sort of all is always in the form of an exception it sort of, it, it seems to be exactly this idea of uh the way that inconsistencies can sort of be fall into again into this uh, logical space which is is beyond the state right which is basically mode like the logic of yeah, I mean, yes. for example, you could you, constantly expurge this to, to stabilize it. It makes a yeah, lot you, of you, sense. You could give an anthropological interpretation of being an event where, you know, a pair of consistent logic accepts like an inconsistent multiplicity, right? Which is the very, let's say, original concept of being an event, which comes before you have situations and states. And then they're always haunted by something inconsistent that you can't really name or locate inside of it. So. We can actually account for all of that. You know, that's really cool. Uh, and I think it gives this, um, uh, so it gives a, a very specific interpretation, let's say to the limits of this, what against the state means. It doesn't mean that it is a power, you know, that you can use against the state. It's actually powerless against the creation of the state in certain boundaries, right? Because I think that there is a nice exchange between either you include the value of the indeterminate, but you can't really guarantee that there isn't something outside that will, another community that will not exchange with you. It will not want to create a world with you. It will prefer to dominate you, right? So rather, for example, than winning a war and killing people in the defeated community, it will keep them alive as slaves. Right, and then keep the dominated community as dominated and not as an indeterminate thing. There's nothing to mourn in the spirits, nothing. It's just, you cut that out. So there is a kind of internal weakness in the logic of reciprocity that both mm -hmm. prevents the formation of the state, but actually keeps the logic of the state as a subcase of its own logic. I think that's also a lot of the limitations in the Karatani and Delusian kind of attempt to use nomadicity as a political reference point because, and again, I'm going to go with the Mongolian Empire, they demonstrated that nomads quickly transform in it. And, and they were just one of like uh, several thousand years of nomads quickly transforming in the empires. They were just the biggest of a long series of these. And so many of the attempts, you know, and, and I, a lot of my reference points are kind of like small communal anarchist political organizations here in the States, but so many of those kind of like community oriented uh, organizing strategies quickly transform when any kind of ethical problem comes up, any kind of disciplinary problem comes up into what you could say is like the internal moment of the Jacobin terror of the state, right? Everything becomes very binary. Everything is very inside or outside. And the communal logic immediately collapses into a very binary kind of like moment. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that this is a really good description of why these things are so connected. And one thing that you said that I think it's a kind of byproduct of what we are doing that I think is really cool is that we, like our discussion doesn't require any reference to stages in development, right? We didn't talk about these are more primitive, therefore this could only exist in societies that didn't really go through this or that, right? So what happens is that we make the logic of potential affinity that Viveiro described, which has many properties we didn't talk about yet, which are very interesting on what happens in social formations where that stability is not fully constituted, that you can talk about the material conditions for similar structures reappearing in contemporary societies. So you don't need to associate perspectivism, which is like the big kind of theme of like the, the thing that makes everyone perplexed about Amerindian societies. Like, oh, so because of this indetermination, people act as if when they encounter an animal, in a kind of indeterminate space, they are not sure who is the human in that encounter, for example. You cannot tell who will acquire the existential value of human and who will be the non-human in that interaction. Uh, so you have this incommensurate perspectives and a world that actually includes that. It's not perspectives between worlds, like 
I live in an empire. That guy lives in this smaller society. We see the world differently. It's not. It's one society that is structured in such a way that it can navigate the fact that it never constituted coherent phenomenological structure, right? That's its coherence. That's why we say it's a logical, it's inconsistent. It's a logic of inconsistent. It's not that it's just inconsistent, it never formed the world, right? So for example, it's not difficult to say that in a social situation of crisis capitalism, where the, the pattern of community formations starts being corrupted and you can no longer trust and create some level of gift giving or reciprocity structures across the social fabric, that perspectivism would reappear under specific conditions. So it's not like people suddenly are afraid of jaguars being people and they are actually the prey and you know something like this, but other ways of incommensurate perspectives might appear. So we also release the logic of perspectivism without making it into a metaphor to be, let's say, a transcendental structure that may, may emerge in any society under certain conditions, right? I mean, isn't, isn't that what happens when so many people start to ascribe like causal efficacy to, to, to act political actors? You know, like I'm thinking of like right wingers attributing things to what Trump did. And right now in particular, like with the invasion of Ukraine, there's this constant refrain that, you know, if Trump were in power, Putin would never have done this. And there's this like, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's stupid on a lot of like obvious levels, but there's like this really complex way in which like they're capable of imputing agency and causality to this person that only arises because the United States kind of like ability to maintain its reign has lost, <laughs> They've like all, like uh, disequilibrium is under the equation, right? The whole multipolar thesis, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, there's some kind of tangible connection between as that instability increases, people are able to attribute more and more causal efficacy in an absurd way that nonetheless like remains tractable to people's kind of social imaginary. Yeah, what, what I would be a bit skeptical of using that example is just because there is some level in which you're saying it's not true what they have to say from their perspective, whereas the logic of perspectivism is one where statements such as, you know, from the perspective of the Jaguar, he's human and I'm, my blood is like a beer for him. That's not a metaphor. That's not like a, a, you know, a metaphor that I know not to be true, but I take it as true because I'm indulging something. That is actually a true, the most efficacious statement you can make. So, but I think for I think for someone totally committed to a conspiracy theory, it's not metaphor for them either. I'm saying it might be no, wrong for me, sure, but I'm saying sure. for them, it's not metaphor, however scary yeah, that might be. But I mean, but then to really believe you're taking it seriously, you would have to include in your description in which sense that's an efficacious statement. But I but generally I agree with you. I'm just wondering if that's how I, the example I would take for something that I nevertheless agree with you. Because for example, sure, yeah, in Brazil probably much, much better ones, yeah. Like for example, in Brazil we have we have, I mean, two things that are interesting. First is that we have an example in Brazil, which is the June journeys in 2013, that like we have that exact problem. Like it's clear that every sector of the left describes it differently in incommensurate ways. And it's hard to say that it's not true, these descriptions in some level, even though you cannot put them all together into a coherent account, right? Or like in a certain sense, the hate for the Workers' Party government is absolutely legitimate and it explains a lot of reality. It's not meant, it's not a fake explanation. But people who say that it was the greatest thing that happened in the left are also saying something true in some way. It's just that you need to account for, let's say, the system of references of both of these social fragments to understand why those are the most efficacious statements to make in different parts of the social composite. So, one thing that I find nice is that, I mean, a lot of analysts like Rodrigo Nunes, who's coming to join us in a bit, started using Viveiros de Castro to try to account for this. Uh, and second, our theory can account for why the guy who thought about this concept came from Brazil. Because after all, we were living through this peripherization, this social fracturing, pretty much in the time that we had this brilliant idea that oh, I should you know, take seriously this sort of perspectivism in a Merindian society. So we can even give us uh, 
social genesis of why this intellectual uh, project appeared here and not elsewhere, you know? Uh, but I, I like this idea very much. I, I, I tend to agree with you that there's something about these weird strangers in modernity that negationists, conspiracy theorists, that it's hard to avoid feeling like they act, their statements actually qualify a bunch of categories of what we call a true statement. It's efficacious of something real. It connects people together. It describes something like, you know, like it, it, but it makes a bunch of the statements. It just seems like it doesn't fit with your own perspective. So uh, for some of these things, I think uh, freeing the problem of perspectivism from being an anthropological concept that only describes certain society, but at the same time, understanding under which conditions this is the case actually makes it useful in other contexts if you respect certain certain very specific uh, constraints, right? Uh, one thing I was thinking uh, is that to respect these constraints, we'd have to find a situation where the, where the, the social terrain is more akin to the to the fragmentation that does not allow the gift giving to establish itself in a in a in a in a uniform way or in a stabilized way, and it seems that the nation is that social terrain in a sense. I mean, uh, because the nation is a, a, a subordinated form of of unity to the state and the state in turn to the capital structure. So I, I think that there's something that helps explain this fragmentation because when you are talking about nationalism, it's not, there's never only one nationalism. It's not a one dimensional society where everyone is, it's not, I don't know, it's not the idea of a unified homogeneous fascism or third or, or, or third right. I don't even, I'm not even entering the merits if that's like that. But if we take these, these, these phenomenons of nationalism and also the perspectives that, the, 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 dissonance, the dissonance of perspectives that emerge from them, the fact that people are saying the truth and are in a sense uh, constructing their discor discourses with uh, a something that is not fake, it's not an illusion, but I do think if we can link up the fact that the, the social terrain, at least in, the, in, the, in relation to the problem of affinity and gift giving, if it is fragmented as we suppose, I think we can account for this, these problems uh, in, a, in a way that I think is even more elegant. I, 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 this is a problem here in Brazil more than maybe in other places, because here in Brazil, we have a multiplication of ontologies due to the ideas of perspectivism. But I think uh, what could be a better way to account for this is not trying to explain ontologies and try to describe, I, I mean, it doesn't matter really what they are, what people think. That, that I don't think that's what, what's the main point. I think the main point is that there is this structure that the, the, the dissonance of, of what people are thinking, discussing. I mean, the imagined communities, it, it is an effect already of a social fragmentation that uh, for some time, it might have been tried to, to be united by other forms. But uh, for example, I think in the case of Brazil, once you don't have any more the promise of a stable job, of, a, of, of being a stable worker, uh, the, 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 the illusionary ground that was holding up certain continuous fictions, it, it seems that the, you, you take the top, top off, I mean, not the top, the bottom, you take the bottom off, and then we fall back into the, to this, I mean, in, in a sense, it's as if we fall to the place of affinity structures. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, 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 I'm a bit between the, 
I'm a bit between the tires tired and confused and I yeah what well, how I would systematize what you're saying a bit which has to do with thank, what John was saying is just that it looks like for example we introduce this idea which is very specific I mean I don't want to say that our perspectivism is everything I'm just saying that well if we if we account for the general possibility of a sort of constitution of reality, which is incommensurate between parts of a social world, through this idea of inconsistent or incons inconstant exchange, which is something we're yeah, yeah. in the text. Okay, it has this condition, which is the sort of indeterminate encounter with another group, which cannot be totally codified by a yes. structure that is previous. Okay, so that's one part. The second yeah. part is uh, you could easily describe you know, the process, uh, which I mean, it's not even a Marxist, but that Robert, uh, the secretary of, of labor in the States who wrote the, the labor of nations. Uh, He's the guy with the YouTube channel? Yeah. Right. Right. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, even from that process, that kind of realization that there is a mismatch between the American empire and the use of internal, the shift from capital circulating inside and organizing the, the world of work in, in the States and this shifting to the outside, all the capital is being invested elsewhere. The, the industrialization, this whole process of destruction of you know, uh, the white American working class. So what you get is that you still keep the entire structure, still keep it relating with capitals, international capital flow, but the nation structure no longer has the support of those two levels. So it's, it's let's say, possible to say that under those condi conditions, you will find the paradoxical situation where you have highly structured territories where reciprocity is very, very strict, very, very consistent. But at the frontier between those territories, what crosses, crosses as a stranger. So for example, Manhattan, the world of New York, the liberal world of New York is perfectly structured. It's not like people don't know what they're gonna find in the streets. Like it's, you know what you're gonna find. You know what, what counts as a person, right? But if you mix the, you know, the Rust Belt with New York, if you mix, mix like Wisconsin and New York, even though those are two very large tectonic plates, there can be crossings there where suddenly in that very specific type of interaction, you don't know the value that the other will give to you and you will give to the other. And in, under our theory, that would count as a sort of inconsistent exchange where there is a level of exchange, but I still cannot make sure that the other I exchange with is not my enemy, right? So there is a mismatch of transcendental constitution. So that would be, let's say it's, it's in, when you describe it in those terms, is enough to see a same operation appearing in Amerindian societies in the lowlands of Brazil and in the interaction between unemployed workers in Tennessee and uh, some liberal celebrity in Hollywood. But you can still keep the difference because one thing is for these encounters to happen in such a way that indetermination is a marked value you know, because there is no nation, right, to kind of sediment the relation between identity, terrain, labor, citizenship, and so on. So it's different, but nevertheless, we could account for it formally by a similar operation. So this way we keep things apart. We're not making like a stupid generalization, but we even get to get the singularity of the phenomenon more strictly, you know. And what I think it's, I mean, this actually brings us to the, the topic we didn't present, but it's the really, really fundamental part, which is we know that the core of Badiou's project in Logics of World is not the transcendental and the phenomenological parts, right? The thing really gains traction. Sorry, I saw the message here. Uh, yeah, exactly. The relationship between true and trust, truth and trust, yeah. Uh, but the Badiou's project only gains traction when he says, yeah, you know, we've been talking about these evaluations of what is identical, what's different, uh, what constitutes something stable and what doesn't, but 
these values, uh, you can you can you create an operator that project projects them back onto the very parts of the world. So you don't need to think of this as a sort of external evaluatory principle. Once you find something that he calls an atom in a world, which is let's say a part that that functions under certain conditions. You can reconstruct, you can resynthesize the whole world from the relation between parts, not the relation between values. So this has a clear counterpart on a very polemic topic of this anthropology that is being developed with the uh, South American societies, which is to say, you shouldn't treat these different perspectives in the way we Westerns are used to treat different cultures, as, as if they're just different set of values that are not agreeing. They want to push us to realize that, I mean, it really has not to do with the representations of the world, but with the actual reference in reality that are different. So that's why they use words like, ah, they have different ontologies or they have different cosmologies. Like it's the whole, the world itself is different. So they want you to take seriously. If you take Kant seriously, they want to take we want you to take as seriously as we take Kant the idea that these perspectives are different, right? It's literally like a different transcendental constitution. So uh, it's it, it's quite interesting to ex to bring this back when we say something like, yeah, there is a mismatch in this weird fringe encounters between shards of the world world. It's not different cultures that are meeting. It's just it's actually that. From the, those different places in the United States, the, the world of United States is constituted different. So the whole web of relations is different, not necessarily in the words that people use, it's not a matter of language, culture, but in the matter of the reference of the words, right? And this is what the atomic logic is so cool because it's not a theory of representation, it's a theory of the structure of the reference of representation, right? It's saying that the way you parse reality itself changes from world to world, right? And the, the point that we are at right now in terms of developing the text is precisely trying to derive from this minimal logic we've been describing to you guys, how you can this, the, uh, derive the four big, let's say, uh, archive logics or, or basic structures of four different types of uh, dispositions or world building modes that we know of, which are animism, totemism, uh, what they call naturalism and analogism, right? Analogism would be like uh, things that you see in a lot of Chinese worldviews and other Asiatic societies where you have this idea that you have this whole chain of hierarchy of being and uh, you kind of, the same hierarchies we have, we are in the same kind of stratified ordering with other creatures where one creature dominates one and then the other dominates the next and you have like this sort of uh, typology naturalism would be this kind of even this even distinction between nature and culture which would be like a modern or western kind of world of way of constructing things uh, then animism would be one where you assume that you share the same sort of anima with the rest of the world, right? So the, every entity has the same interior and the bodies are different. And totemism would be the case where you share both the anima and the body with one particular other, so another species, for example, but not with everything else, right? Uh, so what we need to do right now, that's what we're trying to do, is to show that from the logic of this, this trivalent logic, and this way of constructing the world, you can actually treat animism, totemism, naturalism, and analogism as different ways of parsing what a referent is, right? So that's our current challenge right now. Uh, and the last challenge we haven't really, I mean, we have the basis of this developed, but we haven't really gone into it today which is, let's say, the worldly logic. So once objects are constituted, for example, in a kind of animistic structure or constituted in a totemistic structure or con constituted in a naturalistic structure, like in modern society, whatever, 
what type of relations are accepted and what counts as, let's say, how do you need to be composed in order to see another object, to interact with another object? So for example, in a society where you are allowed to have this sort of in hybrid compositions between natural and supernatural entities, you also need hybrid objects to travel or interact with those relations. For example, so if you're uh, haunted or if you made a bad deal with a spirit, you need an object which is a bit spirit, a bit not, so that it can actually express the relationship between you and a spirit, right? So we can actually account for why shamans need to be composed in certain ways so they can actually interact and make visible relations of a certain type, right? And other crazy things like that. I'm in love with that idea. I really hope we manage to get there. Like we, we're, we're definitely gonna go with like primer territory, like the hundred something pages apparently. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was gonna say that I was thinking this today. I mean, you I think this is like you have to do you someone has to do you guys, I don't know, the the missing mode. The what missing do you mean mode the primer because you're gonna have I mean you you guys are involuntarily doing a primer on mode A. So you did you get you you and Dennis did a primer on mode C. You guys are doing primer on mode A, so the mode I mean, B is finish, missing. Yeah. Finish the job, please. Yeah, no, I, I we need we need to do. It. I mean, I think that we're gonna have a bit more uh, of an easy job with the state logic because first it's a classical thing, so it has a lot of bibliography, you know, on Boolean topuses, and it is the the usual environment to construct a network and graphs of certain mm. types. So mm -hmm. you know, just you connect or you don't connect with another node. You can't like half connect or you can't connect by being disconnected, right? So we, there is some, uh, I, I think we, on one hand, it's gonna be a bit easier. On the other hand, I think we, we did a much better job this time with creating a structure that we can use for the next one, because this description of transcendental, phenomenic logic, atomic logic, and worldly logic, pretty much is the structure that we should repeat in the net last one, right? So I think the question of what is the unstable version of contracts? Uh, what does it mean to stabilize contracts? Yeah. Uh, yeah what does it mean to, to create an atomic logic based on contracts, right? And what does it mean to, so for example, an unstable version of the basic contract is violence, right? Where I made a contract, you you didn't make a contract with me. That's called a commandment, right? Uh, the moment that you have a basic stability, that's called a regular contract, which already implies a certain kind of stability of, and you can build on top of that stability. Uh, I have the impression that we can describe sovereignty in those terms of, uh, for example, a node that everyone is committed to, but it is not committed to everyone. Like we don't have commitments amongst ourselves, but we have commitments to one node. So it's the, let's say, richest node of commitment with everyone. Something like that, you know? You think, you yeah. think that in this case, commitments would have like a, a rational actor type stuff where like, because it's, since it's a classical logic, no, I don't think it implies anything about the uh, actors. That's why it's good, the phenom objective phenomenology, because there is a big debate over if contracts are born rationally or through violence, right? So we can just say it doesn't matter. That's even part of the violence. I mean, this is Hobbes' genius, right? When he said, well, you can create, one, yeah, like there's the commonwealth of, of uh, agreement or the commonwealth of fear. And the crazy thing about the logic of the state is that it doesn't matter if you willingly gave up power or if you were coerced to give it, it is efficacious in both ways. Right? No, yeah, yeah, okay. That's the objective of the logical point of view. I, I, was talking, I was talking about, I mean, if like the, the, the rational 
the rational commitment in the sense I was thinking it as like the 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 version of uh, the what, what what's the the elementary structures of kinship, but to the contract mode. But I mean, yeah, I I, I think you would you would probably have something like uh, inconsistent. I don't know. Just just riffing up here, like I think the consistent contract would be something where you have this weird. It's basically the logic of domination without the value of indetermination, right? So. Yeah, something is included in something. It becomes classic. You, you either yes or no, right? When you remove it, so yeah, you're either. It makes sense that the first step would be like both the appearance of a binary relation and the appearance of a kind of classic domination, right? Either you're included in me or I'm included in you, and that's only two options. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, then I think that the contract implies that this this acquires a sort of. Uh, horizontality between two while we're both submitted to a third right so uh that would be like the minimal form like for example we set up a contract and the contract is the thing that reigns over both of us right so that's how you would start going into uh yeah. stability i think that if you want to generalize that then you need the sovereign because then we're no longer establishing commitments amongst each other we're establishing commitments to one thing so that we can not have commitments amongst each other, right? Yeah. So you can generalize it like that. Like everyone is centralized to one thing, then we can all get dispersed because we don't need to have direct relations amongst each other, something like this. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, it, it's easier to, to find out from the structure that was used on the anthropological primer, what would be the atom? Like if we just follow this, the atom would appear in a more clear way than having to to search the atom or where's yeah and i think that the the issue of atomic logic in in classical logic is usually the the issue of what counts as a singleton what counts as a unitary set with one element inside mm -hmm. right? even if that element is actually filled with stuff you don't see yeah doesn't yeah. matter it counts as a basic unit so citizenship units of measure uh things like that so I think that we probably are going to use uh, J, uh, James Scott's scene like a state, which is very, very much in line with what we're saying. Like he talks a lot about all the difficult processes of creating unified metrics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as the kind of even popular revolt, trying to stabilize state logic. Like he actually turns it around and says, like, it's not true that. Uh, it was a top-down process that the state established common measures because originally these common measures were not respected. They were arbitrary. So he gives a lot of really cool examples of how uh, a peasant would come to give the king or the representative its due and the basket where you had to put the wheat was larger, but written the same number outside. And people demanded uh, standardization of metrics to prevent power from exploiting the instability of the measures. So at first he said it's actually a popular demand that the, that the standardization be produced. Uh, and then he accounts for a bunch of, I mean, the way that you project the state metrics back onto the world. So the management of forests where people try to kind of parse the reality of a forest in terms of quantities of wood, quantities of water uh, that you need to use, how much wood you can extract. So you get to see the whole world being parsed out in terms of that logic. So I think that there's also really cool stuff on the atomic logic and then stuff on sovereignty, democracy, as they say, special objects that you know, make relations universally exposed in that world. So the sovereign is to state how the shaman is to a uh, uh, Mode, how money and capital are to Mode C and so on. So it's, it's doable. And then we will have unified the whole of social theory. It will acquire its proper name, which is just the theoretical branch of the communist international. And we're set, you know, like finally. <laughs> the work will be done. Then the first stage of the work will be done. <laughs> then we can begin. <laughs>
if communism doesn't arrive by then, I don't know. What it will stop. take so long to do this. <laughs> like it will come and then go and we'll still be at it. Yeah, we'll still, we'll still have to do the mixing of the modes. But one thing, just to just to bring another topic, uh, I'm one thing that I'm really really impressed. I'm, I really want to know what you guys think in the text because I think it's very hard to explain. But I'm understanding it a bit better now, and I, I really think we. It's a new thing that we found, uh, but you doesn't go deep into this, so it's actually a contribution, which is uh, the relation between logic and nature or material reality. In this theory of atoms, uh, I think it's really, really the complicated part. Uh, and it was really amazing to see that Levi Strauss's theory of the relation, because Levi Strauss is famous for saying that actually, you know, affinity comes before, like the symbolic dimension of exchange comes before the blood types. You don't derive the symbolic out of the blood relations between people. And those are, let's say, the unity of the family is people's hereditary relations, right? He starts with the symbolic, and then he tries to show how the symbolic structure absorbs these natural traits of sex sexuated re reproduction into it, right? And kind of resignify this into itself. And the way that he explains this is really, really amazing. I find it's ridiculously sophisticated. Like I, my understanding of what meant that, that he was a structuralist, and, and in sometimes it does look like that's what, what it is. Like when he doesn't care for the material support, he's just talking about functional relations. I didn't expect to find such a sophisticated theory of how alliances reproduce the logic of, of affinity and alliances propagates itself by finding differences which are originally totally foreign to this. Like it's just a physiological thing a biological thing. It might be a social thing, but it has nothing to do with that field. And then it latches on to those characteristics and propagates itself through them, right? So it's, for example, he talks about, uh, it's really beautiful. He says, natural, like nature only determines that once a couple gets together and has a kid, traits from the parents will, will pass to the kid. But it doesn't, but it leads to randomness. Who is the parent? And what affinity does is that it narrows the contingency and exploits that latitude of indetermination of nature to propagate certain traits uh, through nature itself. So the logic of affinity, it latches, it finds something in material reality, which is totally indifferent to affinity and to people and whatever, and finds a way to reproduce itself through that trait, right? And I find this idea, I mean, it's so on point with our own theory of real abstraction in capitalism, when we have that idea that, well, abstract labor is actually a restriction of activities to only those activities that propagate value. So you are finding a material process, which even though it's indifferent because people create things regardless of capitalism, uh, even though it's indifferent, you can limit it, select it, ref refine it so that it's only those transformations that propagate the logical value. It's very similar. He has a theory of the real abstraction of hereditarity. It's, it's amazing. Sorry, John, yeah? Actually, Laura Mahanda wanted to think a little bit longer on it. Ah, okay, sorry. But, but yeah, I don't know, I just found that amazing. And this is kind of the insight I'm currently trying to expand because Levi-Strauss only exploits this directly when he's talking about the atom of kinship uh, and the way that, you know, it includes no longer only affinity, but also blood relations. So this, this natural aspect that is propagating the logic of affinity, it's part of the atom. That's why it's a real atom. It, it, the, the logical difference is supported in material differences, right, of hereditary. But he doesn't generalize this to say 
any natural property could, in principle, support the logic of affinity. And I feel like one of the things we're trying to work out now is that you can actually distinguish between the relation of, let's say, certain societies to the land, to ecosystems, to, to the, the kind of dynamic of many species together. Uh, this is integrated into the world in a way that you don't make a clear distinction between nature and culture because the atom that supports the structure of affinity in that group is propagated by natural traits, which are not, are not the hereditary traits of sexuated human beings, but for example, by relations of predation amongst many species, including humans in this uh, ecosystem, right? So you can actually have like a, you can generalize a theory of atoms of kinship to atoms of affinity. And depending on what natural characteristic you latch onto, and it doesn't need to be natural in the sense of it's necessarily something that comes from physics or biology. Right? It just needs to be indifferent to the logic of affinity. It's external to that particular world. Uh, so depending on what you latch onto, you require that part of the world to be included into your world. Like it's not outside, it's not the inverse, it's not it cannot be named as the other side of it, right? This is the bottleneck theory. The bottleneck theory. Yes. We're calling it bottleneck theory because imagine the <laughs> atom is this point where the logic touches on the material and you can have like really large bottlenecks. Exactly. So that a large space of material reality is actually supporting the logic or a very narrow space, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I find that the craziest but also coolest part of it all. Like, I'm, I'm still struggling with it, but I think it's it's also one of the most perplexing uh, results. This seems like one of the, I guess, like my original thought was something like, this is like a real place where like logic as an actual practice and like like kind of like starts to emerge like where it can actually kind of like bite into reality for the first time like because it's existing cognitively but not self like not self-reflexively as logic but self-reflexively in the sense that like people have to verify that these relationships actually work right like when you have a kinship relationship there's reflection on any given partnering and how well those kind of like fit the rules, I guess. Like, like they're, they're basically like better and worse verification procedures for whether or not any given pairing really is reasonable. Yeah, John, but you see the crazy thing, I mean, and this connects directly with something you were doing because another name for this relation where something materially structured is conductive to a logic is logistics, right? Logistics mm -hmm. is a name of material lineaments like roads, train systems that they can be black boxed because they're not adding anything they're meant not to add but to guarantee the continuation of something so if i put a commodity into a truck in a in a road that is meant for commodity transportation with a worker who is formalized and you know lose the job if it doesn't work in a certain way i can black box the whole transportation get the product in the end and know that it will have preserved the value the same thing is what we're talking about. Hereditarity is a logistics of affinity. We're saying that, you know, I put an affinity on one side, I black box how sexual reproduction works, but I know that what will come in the other, in the bottom of it, which is a kid, will have preserved some values. And if then they married with somebody, some values are preserved and so on and so forth. So actually, the, uh, perhaps the proper name of this bottleneck theory of real atoms is, you know, the point of touching between logic and logistics, right? Because it's the theory of material differences, which can be practically formatted. They don't need to be out there in the, in the wild. They can be like created for this particular purpose, right? But in such a way that things that would move outside of our control, for example, I put a commodity in your hands and say, go somewhere and sell it there. Like you might break it. It might rocks. I don't know what will happen. I don't know when you will arrive, right? So you would leave the commodity world. But through the road, through the lineament that we created in material reality, 
those two places outside of each other that could be evaluated differently glue together and i know evaluations now match mm -hmm. so logistics production and uh hereditary and consanguinity and all different ways that affinity can kind of propagate through other non-affinity traits they mm -hmm. all form the set of let's say kind of a uh, trees, three different versions of, let's say, a logistical support of a logic, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's when you get into all the, like, so-called, like, bourgeois signifiers of the business world, right? Like, those are the actual affinity operations that let you know if you're inside already, like, the world of business. And that often makes the difference between accessing and being able to start and not, not anything having to do with mode B or C itself. But like that so. yeah but for example one, one thing that i think we can interpret is i mean this was written people already wrote a lot about this but for example we can now interpret why usually the state requires uniforms because you need to make sure it's, it's a logistical support for eliminating the indeterminate value of encounters right when I see somebody else with the same uniform, I already know where they stand in such a way that the values are connected. It facilitates that everything sees itself in the same way, right? If I enter a building and somebody approaches me and they're not using wearing a uniform, I don't really know if they work there or if they don't. It might be anything, right? It's an encounter in this sense of affinity. Whereas if I know they're already with a uniform and they're approaching me in the condition of somebody who has certain commitments and doesn't have some commitments, the indeterminate value is excluded. And now we have a binary structure of a commitment. I can actually tell the person, do your job right. Meaning, yeah, that's, don't. that's a very material bonding point of the singleton, right? Like you have the uniform and the yeah. singleton. And like that's Perfect. precisely. Yeah, the uniform, exactly. <laughs> like they actually, and that, that becomes like a way in which like, you're more citizen than the rest of the citizens or the ones that bear that in some way as police or soldiers or whatever, in which you have this extra, well, we're a little more a belong, belonging to the nation than everyone else, precisely because we embody it as singletons of the state. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that, that there is probably where I would go towards, like- yeah, That's really uh, interesting. Yeah, but I, I'm really, really fond of this approach to, a kind of general theory. I mean, logistics seems so much connected to state logic, right? So perhaps it should be kept where the word already has that meaning. But this theory of atoms, of finding this resolution in which a certain differential logic latches onto material bases, right? Mm -hmm. That general theory is the theory that logistics is a case of, you know, the propagation of affinity through traits of the natural world and so on is another version of it. And a theory where production is also a version of, because production is the way, the moment where circulation enters into its underground, as Marx says, and managers and workers and so on need to make guarantee practically that the commodities that come in on one side are valued at least as much as the one that comes on the other side. So you're also taking a black box, which is the moment of production, and stitching together the transcendental values, right? So production is to generation, which is to logistics, as this moment where logical structure needs to latch on to material reality to guarantee that the logical values keep consistent, right? We know that in the case of capital, keeping consistent means self-valorizing, doesn't mean keeping the same values. You need to actually have more, right? But, uh, but the basic principle is, is, is really cool to see that it's actually it accounts for all those things while keeping them separate, right? And giving us a way to start, I think, plugging them into each other conceptually, like what it means. Like, I, I think that what you just said about logistics is really interesting to then think about how certain branches of the state kind of then internally recompose their own mode A and we get, you know, corruption, nepotism and all that. But like very much within the logical scaffolding of a state. And I think shows like The Wire really, once again, help show this because like, it's not like some abstract community it's a community that's like built around the structure of the state and to be part of the community is to understand how to maneuver through that construction like you're a 
if you're an, if you're a cop and you don't understand what it means to like be part of the blue line you're a liability to all the other cops and they show mm -hmm. that kind of with that one guy that ends up becoming a teacher he literally like even though he belongs in a way hereditarily since his like granddaddy or whatever is that major cop he can't negotiate the state constraints in a way that allows him to actually remain in the police force so he's he's outed and he has to find his place in another part of the state where he does fit in finally in the in the, in the school system but i think it really shows that communities can kind of like uh symbiotically form around different kinds of institutional configurations on the level of mode b yeah what i think it's actually really cool to think about is is this i mean we, we drew this before right i mean just to just to go really quickly over it like so in the case of mode a you have these three values in the case of mode b you only have these two values so we know that move to move from here to here you're erasing the this indeterminate value right and but capital actually has between the minimal and the maximal it has all these infinite values right so this is why this is the most complicated arrow, which is the relation between Heiting algebra and Breuer algebra. How do you move between these two? No, sorry, this one. The Heiting and the Brouwer, right? This is the, the complicated arrow everyone's trying to understand. But this thing we were talking about is very interesting because, for example, you dissolve communities by creating a state, but it's meant to propagate capitalist logic, which actually introduces the idea of an in-between. So even though like salary, uh, uh, uniform people, bourgeois, uh, bourgeois uh, bureaucratic managers and so on, they're, unif they're made to navigate this logic. It's, this is meant to support a logic that has more values than the logic of the state. So for example, no wonder that the, this the way that these communities return once you block them through the state is true trying to make more money, like corruption, nepotism, right? Is a sort of pseudo community true capital. It's not like, you know, the, the policemen suddenly create a new community when, you know, there's a subgroup of policemen and criminals who are brothers. No, it's like militias, mafia, and so on. Like, it's not the same as just a community, right? I mean, you can even say that mafia goes straight to here, whereas the, the kind of no police uh, affinity is actually a weird mixture of these three things here, but it just goes to show that there's probably a lot to extract in terms of more complicated logics, you know, like uh, that you can get from mixing these three logical structures, you know. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to like look at like any particular like i thought about this a lot in terms of like local governments here in the states like a municipal level government or certain departments of state governments like what it would look like to actually compare or find similar like or, you know find the difference or similarities between different mappings of like what you know like these kind of communities versus institutional rules and like mm -hmm. who gets to like have access to them it'd be very difficult to actually do that uh with actual data because <laughs> you can't really get a mapping of it but you could simulate it and i think something uh efren mentioned last time with uh actor uh agent uh, multi-agent system simulation yes yeah I, I read a little bit up on that and that seems like something like that combined with like a rule-based kind of like approach to what we're doing like each one of these modes offers a different set of rules that you can then kind of combine It'd be really interesting to see like what kind of like models come out when you when you run those simulations. Yeah, you know, just on the on the on the phenomenological side. I mean, a good example of how different it is to think about communities and communities that are formed on top of the state is that, for example, ninety nine percent of people, if you ask them, look, clearly the policemen make a community, not just a classical binary group, right? Of a part of the state. Is there an indeterminate value in that community? People will say, no, they want money, right? So every time you could have an imbalance with a reappearance of a community that there is something in their interior which is like indeterminate, you actually already have a name for it because it's corruption, you know, 
it's nepotism, it's power, it's never an indeterminate thing. So it's nice to, to think perhaps that every new community that emerges on top of the state, uh, phenomenologically in a capitalist world, you never get to see that indeterminate value because it's already interpreted as, well, meaning the intermediate values of, you know, valorization. Trying to make something, making more money than you already make and things like that, right? You don't see people creating new groups inside the state and not being indexed into, well, what the, the indeterminate aspect of their existence is still to be determined. No, it's always money, right? So it never gets to have maximal value of appearance, the fact that a new group was created. It always seems like what they, this indeterminate core is actually just wanting money. Yeah, anyway, even Thiago went there. Probably that's a sign. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely going to present the text fully once it's done. Uh, I think, like, we already have the technical mathematical part down in the whole text. We're now adding the ethnographical descriptions and the debates with anthropologists, like, specific showing that what we're saying formally actually matches what Levi Strauss was saying, what the Vera de Castro was saying. Uh, and we're probably going to send it to Viveros afterwards, see if he wants to engage with it as well. Nice. That's really exciting. This yeah, is really, really cool. Um, yeah, this was a really big step forward. Yeah, I mean, I think so too. And I hope that this is also also motivates you to meet me so we can now start the third. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, uh, I think I'm more open than you are. So uh, if if you want to set a, you know. No, let's do it, man. Like uh, one thing that I think would be like the, ba the, the, the very, very basic thing we would have to do to move forward is my opinion is that the best text to use as a basis besides, I don't know, Hobbes himself would be to use uh, th that book, Seem Like a State. Like I wanna go, I, I don't think the whole of it is interesting, but at least it's the most pre-formatted description of these things that we can use, you know? Uh, I have the impression that the bibliography for doing a similar thing to contracts uh, would have to go through Hobbes, probably Kantorovitz in the description, description of the two bodies, uh, the scene like a state book. I wonder what I've else. I've used a lot of uh, philosophy of right with Karatel. Yeah, philosophy of uh, right, even with Hegel, yeah. Because you can't get, he's, he's all about them contracts and that. Yeah. And I think, he, I think he draws out a lot of interesting connections with uh, Mode in particular, but also Mode C. Yeah. Um, but again, it's hard because to develop the pure form, like because we're the pro the easy thing with mode A is that we're talking about societies where mode B and C are not fully developed. So in, in the immediate presentation of, let's say, an Amerindian society, doesn't include state and commodity. But when you move to, for example, contemporary capitalism, you get all the modes interacting, property law, commodity logic, and community. So the, the good thing is that Marx abstracts from communities and property when he's discussing capital. So that work was previously done. I think one of the biggest challenges for doing the same thing with contracts is that there isn't really a theory, a pure theory of the state logic. Like it's either a theory of the modern state where capital and communities are already implied. Uh, you know, so it's too hybrid. You need to extract this pure theory. And there is no kind of classic bibliography that already did the, the base, base work. Like it would be too easy to mix together the different modes if you take empirical cases, you know? That's what I yeah, thought was I, so I, good I, about the Mongolian empire that you chose because it goes from nomadic to state very quickly. Exactly. So it's almost like one of the most, the, one of the purest examples of empires, right? Yeah, and I mean, and I think it also kind of in a weird, <laughs> weird scientific way it accomplishes all the goals of all the great empires really quick. So you can't be like, it didn't do what all the other ones wanted to do, which is, I think part of the thing that's 
uh, a problem with the state. Like there's there's this there's not like like with when Marx writes capital, it's not like on the one hand, he can abstract away these two things. And on the other hand, he has the figure of the worker who's kind of like in opposition to the, this particular thing that he's studying. And it's unclear like what, what we would be recovering from the state in the way we think of workers like taking control of the workplace. You know, I think- Yeah, but, but, yeah, but I would be, yeah, but I then, in that case, I, I, I disagree a bit because I think that the worker is not, in opposition to capital in Marx, like the proletariat is in opposition, but it's quite invisible to commodities. Whereas labor power and the worker as the wage worker, that's just a concept of capital that is not in contradiction to the rest of the construction, right? So, okay, okay, that, right. I mean, the fair. logic of the thing that is invisible to capital within workers is not really described in capital as well at all, right? So I don't think we need to worry about that, like. Honestly, I think the figure of the citizen is pretty analogous to the figure of the worker, to the figure of the person in community logic, right? I'd say, how does, how, how do indiv human individuals look when parsed by these logics, right? When you parse the logic of, uh, of, uh, of reciprocity, if you are considered an actor, then you are considered a person. Right? When you parse down the logic of state, uh, if you're considered an actor, you're considered a citizen. right? And if you parse out the logic of capital, when well, that is a bit more complicated, but pretty much you're considered a worker, right? because your energy is labor, labor power and so on and so forth. So I don't think we need to include some contradiction. Actually, I've been thinking a lot about this and uh, because, sorry, yeah? Well, for me, it's, it was less a question of contradiction. I think actually what you said helps clarify my my problem a little better because in a way, yeah, you're right. Like it's not the worker, it's proletariat and the proletariat doesn't really figure in capital. But I guess you could say that Marx asked the motivating questions of capital from the question of how do you like go from the worker in itself to the proletarian itself to the proletariat for itself, right? Like there's a kind of like structure, there's a political question about like the radicalization of workers and what it means for workers to be subjectivized around the problem of capital and like reappropriating capital. And I don't think that uh, there, like, while the citizen is something that's like for the state, I don't think that there's kind of like an analogous thing towards which you're radicalizing, if that makes sense. Like, no, look, I, I, I would just, sorry, just to, just to, to make a distinction there. Like, I, at least I agree with you that Marx would cannot write capital without being a communist in the sense that you wouldn't even have the problem of what is the thing that doesn't change when everything changes, which is value, if you're not committed to things changing, right? Uh, but that's not really, let's say, the inner structure of the description of capital. Like, I don't think there's any com any commitment in capital to workers being able to reappropriate capital, like in those terms exactly. I think that's much more ambivalent at least, right? But on the other hand, I think we do have exactly what you're saying in the state logic, because I mean, that's Karatani's point, that's his reconstruction of Hobbes, which is a guy who was fucking scared of what had happened in England like in the last 30 years, right? And who was taking seriously the fact that uh, what had happened with Cromwell and all those shit, right? It's kind of a conservative, but it takes seriously the fact that there is a weird transitivity between an empty seat of power and a positive seat of power with the sovereign. Like you can cut the sovereign and keep an empty place and it still works. So definitely Hobbes was aware as an honest conservative that there was something that needed to be restructured to be prevented from moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. With the levelers and all that. Like there is a revolution, failed or whatever you want to call it, that he's answering too, right? And he's much more honest about it than the following theorists of right, like Locke or Mill, whatever, those, those fellows, right? About the fact that there is this inner danger in the state. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, 
what you just characterized earlier about this kind of like uh, structural ambivalence and instability of like basically mode B is within mode A and kind of like fall back into mode A in a certain kind of way. Um, like that's that's a lot of what Hobbes is concerned about, like the factionalization, the particularization, and also the kind of like uh, way that inside and outside becomes extremified through that with religion. Yeah, because outside. yeah, because for example, I like I, I, at least personally, I like the the double critique of of Hobbes that says first uh, there is a weird idea that he should begin with individual domination over another individual when clearly the state is historically born of communities dominating others. So there, there is no state where everyone does, state of nature where everyone does what they want is a perpetual war and the state creates peace on top of that. Because you actually have a war of a community against another and then a process of domination and that's the base, right? And the second critique, which I also like is that not really named war, right? Historically for Hobbes, it's the leveler process and that mayhem, that's what he actually saw, right? That need to be let's say, absorbed by a new version of the state. So I, th I think it, 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 there is actually a good dialogue to be had with what you're saying. There's a really good book on this by Oliver Felton called Anatomy of a Failure, which is the most in-depth analysis of the leveler movement that I've ever seen. Like just in the documents Anatomy and day to day, Anatomy of Failure. He's a Badgerian, in fact, uh, he's translator of being an event. And he decided to study, let's say, the political thinking of the levelers. But he like goes from the, their documents, like day to day, what they were doing, how, what the responses were, how they reacted to that. They, he actually treats it as a legitimate political movement with actually a novel position. And he reads Hobbes as answering to that, like, how do we, how do we prepare so that this doesn't happen again? Uh, and, and Karatani has a similar reading, right, in, in, in Structure of World History. So uh, I don't know. I feel like there is a similar, right? I mean, if you even there, there's a nice analogy. Like what we did with reciprocity is to show that the encounter, what Vivero de Castro calls encounter in the forest, which is this indeterminate encounter where you don't know if you find a, found a friend or a foe, right? And if you're the prey or the predator of that encounter, that indeterminate encounter, we, we were trying to show that that's the basis for reciprocity in general, right? You can read Hobbes as saying that there is some, some form of popular unrest, right? Which uh, Rousseau will call like the general will, which is kind of this indeterminate encounter and you need to stabilize it so that it only appears in the form of the will of the sovereign, right? And Marx does something similar with the accidental form of value and saying that, again, there's something as arbitrary about that. And the, it takes a lot of work to turn it into a consistent exchange space where you no know, simple circulation and capital appear. So we can actually pinpoint the sort of inconsistent points of beginning where there's something weirdly indeterminate that it takes a lot of work to kind of stabilize as you move along, you know? I mean, it's not like we don't have enough work ahead of us. And that, that's actually a really interesting place. To, yeah, to just jump into another connection with the lenses, because it seems like one of the ways you could kind of model that would be to ask the question of like, how as you stabilize it, do people ask the question of how to prevent it destabilizing and how you kind of like fold back in new context as you go? Because as you add on new layers, there are new ways in which the stabilization can occur. Mm hmm or that things can kind of propagate <coughs> down from new dimensions down to older things and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, one thing that, I, that, I, that occurred to me is that it's very interesting to see how this problem of stabilization of state, I mean, the current story goes something like, well, everyone delegates their will to the, to the sovereign. So, you, you abdicate some freedom for a third party, and then you get some partial freedom amongst each other, right? That's a first stabilization. The problem with that is that now you have a contradiction. You try to create a consistent logic, but it's contradictory because the 
you need the sovereign to be also a node in a network. So you need to be a citizen and a sovereign. You need to be outside and inside the law. So the whole Agamben shtick, right? State of exception, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And then you stabilize that by emptying out the sovereign and you redistribute that into everyone. So now everyone, you have like a democracy kind of structure, right? And the birth of modern citizenship where you're not a, you're not a sovereign and a subject, but a citizen and an empty core, right? So you can actually describe that as a process of stabilizing this network of commitments, right? Uh, yeah, stabilizing the network and also stabilizing new layers of protocols that enable it to be expanded. And kind of, and I think those like new layers are where a lot of the interesting kind of frictions within states, when they kind of like start to, when they start to malfunction under whatever conditions, a lot of those kind of like uh, architectonics over time or what, like those different levels kind of start crunching into each other, breaking down. And that's when we see things manifest as breakdowns within states. Yeah, I mean, for example, you know, it, it makes sense to me that you will treat the state logic of territory as a classical logic. Like it's meant to have an inside and outside and nothing in between. Right. It's very different, for example, from the logic of territory for indigenous people, where you're not inside or outside of a terrain. You're indeterminately connected to the terrain. It's you are the terrain. You can't really tell the two things apart. You know, you, you remove some people from where they live and they get sick because you took a part of them away. That's not you need a trivalent logic where the terrain is neither inside nor outside of a person. Right? Whereas the state is either outside or out, inside or outside. And you need borders to control that. So you can, that's classically organized as well. So there's a lot of interesting ways to, to think about that. And one thing that I'm, I'm working on now that it's making, I think will help us is that uh, I've been reading a book that is very, very clear on how you arrive at category theory through graph theory. So how you move from graphs of connections in a network, what you need to add to a graph so that it actually functions like a category, right? And I have the impression that the logic of commitment is very graph-like. Like when we say something like, mm -hmm. people can remove their commitments and connect to one person, and then you define a king or a sovereign based on the, almost like the number of connections, right? And things like that. Uh, I think that now I'm understanding there is a very natural continuity between uh, graph theory and category theory. And the cool thing that it has everything to do with private property in a certain interpretation, because graphs are only connecting nodes to other nodes. Categories also connect nodes to themselves. So you would need to have an interpretation to what does it mean to have a commitment to yourself, right? And yeah. That's pretty much property logic for Lockheed, right? The idea that, I mean, I own the things that I am. So you, the relation between you and yourself is also evaluated by the state. That's your property. You're your own property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? and that's, that's precisely like the opening move of the philosophy of right is that, is that step. Once you make that step, all the rest of the stuff flows from that. But you have to make that first kind of move. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, and you get the contradiction because if I am my own property, what, what wins? My commitment to myself or my commitment to a sovereign? So you only get like consistent property logic in a democracy because then your commitment to yourself is the maximal commitment compared to your commitment to cent central power, right? There's <laughs> no one there. So you're not really the property of anyone, but the property structure of the state is preserved. So, uh, I don't know. I'm, now I'm, I'm, no, now I'm, I'm, we're starting something else, but but I I'm excited about. I mean, I feel like this is where we got to start taking the step towards things like uh, 18th Brumaire, because then you get to the full circle of when the property classes reinvest in sovereign, in a particular sovereign, precisely because everyone that doesn't have property starts to rise up, right? So like, so you have. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're, I, I feel like this is how we're going to work together. Like I'm trying to understand the simplest version and, you're, and you already are seeing like all these elements together. But yeah, I, I, I get the last crazy way. Yeah, it'll, it'll come together. 
No, well, it will. It will, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm 100% sure I'll also lose nights of sleep over formalizing property law. Actually, there are some papers in this direction. But right? when we say we have the ABCs of Marxism, we fucking mean it. Yes, exactly. Like when we say the ABC of communism, it's going to be like for real this time. Yeah, exactly. After Probachevsky. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been excellent. Um, glad to finally, well worth the wait. Let's just put it there. No, yeah. No, thanks, man. I, I know it's a lot and it's very, it's still kind of confusing. Hopefully we'll get a more elegant presentation of these things once we're done. We're also spending so much time making like snarky remarks at like philosophers of anthropology and saying they're wrong and taking such pleasure in doing so that, that it probably will, ha will have to kind of uh, cut it down, you know, in the final version because it's a bit too much. Yeah, but this is similar to, I think, the way the primer went was there was like a lot of sessions and then like questions and then by the end there, you guys went through it really quickly and succinctly and yeah, there were was... lots of diagrams. And that's, that's where I know it's like, it's the pasta is almost ready is when the diagrams are outweighing the number of words on the page. But you know, <laughs> I think that the primary, uh, I mean, there's a reason why we never wrote, I mean, we've been working hard, but then it's, you have this one thing, which is we try to understand the simple and you to go, I understand the simple and then move to the complex, but you start from the complex and then move to the simple. And th th then it has this other thing, which is, also hard to sync with, which is when you're ending the comprehension of one mathematical structure, he thinks that the better comprehension appears when you consider this other bigger mathematical structure. So <laughs> every time we're writing a more introductory version to you know, the logic of capital, he comes up with a different logical or mathematical structure it will be better than the one I was already trying to understand. So <laughs> always lagging behind on the mathematical. So we never wrote something as clear as this text we're writing for, for reciprocity. Like the primer is much, much more dense than this thing, I think. Uh, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's also better integrated with the current literature. Like we don't quote anyone in the primer, right? We just say, yeah. here's not even Marx. We just say like, these are all the concepts and they're structured like this, blah, 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 blah. blah. Like this mm -hmm. time we actually stop and give examples and things. So I think it's also a good kind of uh, blueprint for writing a more introductory version of the primer itself at some point, you know? Yeah, no, and as well as like a, a good roadmap for mode B. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, guys. Let That's me great. cook dinner now. My dog great thinks I'm gonna walk in. He understands English, but apparently he's looking at me. Okay. See you guys. Juliana, really good to see you, man. Thanks. I'm 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 still finding myself in the conversation, just arriving still, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. No worries, it. man. I, I you 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 arrived at one of the most the weirdest meetings possible. So no, I, it's it is it's it's funny. I, I I find that you're you're debating uh questions and, and going into much greater detail and greater depth uh, in both logical and ph phenomenological terms uh, that I've been I've been sort of tussling with I'm, I'm quite I'm quite keen to see where you're going with the logic of the state um, partly because I've been slowly trying to uh, trying to think through a, a, a problem that, that emerges in in my in my writing um, sort of a historical a historical problem that, that I see as a something of a divergence between the logic of capital and the logic of the state or what I in that document I sent you called the logic of empire let's say the, the, the expansionist re, expansionist reason of state mm -hmm. um, and connecting that possible divergence to an instability in the moment of collapse um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how you're how you're connecting these 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 logics and and i'll definitely be uh silently uh, <laughs> accompanying accompanying you for the, for the next next few well, sessions uh, as much as i can i think that probably we, we would actually benefit from hearing what you've been thinking about these things because we're still a bit far away from since we're trying to construct these three logics to then have let's say more piecemeal questions about how they relate 
Uh, we're yes. still far away from being able to talk about, let's say, disjunctions between these things or things like this. I think we have some hypotheses, but we haven't really developed it. So anything that you can also bring that you think are interesting case studies or hypotheses of how you see these things, it might also go a yeah, long I mean, way I, I, to I, kind of preparing I, the ground for us as well. I'm, I'm, I'm still very much at the, the, the hypothesis stage, which I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to ground really, uh, but, it, but it, 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 it comes off the back of a, a quite long series of discussions about contemporary imperialism and the, the, the anachronism of, of theory, classical theories of imperialism um, and trying to rethink what, what it might mean that imperialism was once the latest stage of, of capitalism as it as Lenin posed it in, in the original script. Uh, and, and, and that potentially being a moment of maximum convergence between the logics of capital and the logic of state. Um, but, but, but that sort of leads me to this. In fact, in, 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 the, in the chapter that I, that I previously sent you, I talk about a great introflection, uh, a moment in the change of directionality or let's say changing the emphasis um, in, in, in capital's logic of expansion. Uh, and and that is connected, I suppose, to this idea that there comes a moment when expansionisms don't necessarily, um, the, the two expansionisms I'm refer, referring to, don't necessarily have the same level of, of in, interdependence or uh, mutual interest, let's say, <laughs> it yeah. starts, starts, starts to, uh, and, and trying to connect that to the, the re-emergence of an inside outside in recent times. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, that's very, very so, but, but yeah, but I, I see the, the connections there, like which would definitely, yeah. I mean, if you're up for it at some point, like we, I told you this, right? We, we were sharing our essay among some of us and we, there was a definite interest of like sure. having a, a meeting to debate what you wrote and- Sure, sure. And I, I, I suppose I, I, I'd, be, uh, I'd be quite interested to see if, how, 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 you could, how one of you would approach the essay um, because it's, it's, it's uh, quite intentionally disjointed uh, but 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 um, and 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 as 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 many of my essays are, uh, tend to be it, it it's pointing to six other essays that I'm <laughs> to write, you know sounds so like exactly Arthur yeah like, like very much our, our bread so, and butter so I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great, so, but, uh, was, anyway, all right, cool. Let's let's keep going conversation. And thanks, thanks for having me along. Oh, it was a pleasure. <laughs> see you, John. All right. See you, all all right, see you all later. Bye. See you all. See you next time.